three May 2022 work session meeting of the Salt Lake City City Council. We welcome the members of the public who are in person and who may be watching our vid usual video feeds online. Hybrid council meetings allow people to join online through WebEx or in person at the city and county building. We are continuing to watch COVID rates to make the safest choice for all of us. Masks are no longer required in city facilities, but attendees who prefer to continue using a mask are welcome to do so. We will continue to monitor the situation and take any and all reasonable precautions for the public and staff. As many as you know, there is no public comment during the work session. However, please join us at the 7 o'clock formal meeting tonight to share your, any comments. Your feedback is always welcome, and you can share with the City Council anytime by mailing us at P.O. Box 146 Salt Lake City, Utah 84114, or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or calling our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Taylor will be moderating today's meeting. And as we always do, we, we start off our work session meetings with an informational update from the administration. Uh, today we have the mayor with us, uh, Rachel Otto in person, and we have Lisa and I think Andrew online. Mayor, great to see you. Thank you, Scott. Council Chair, I'll just quickly interject to say that Andrew Johnston is not with us today and Weston Clark is not with us today, but Ava Lopez is with us today to give the community outreach update. And Rachel will cover the homeless update. We still have info for you. Thanks for bringing that up, Scott. Um, we'll start with our COVID updates for you. If we can go to the next slide. We're, we're seeing a real plateau in the bit of the up from the slight uptick that we had been seeing. Um, numbers are looking pretty good compared to the past. And the eligible population being up to date is only 36% um, on vaccines. So people who are eligible for their subsequent boosters or any booster whatsoever, please take care of that. It's still available. Um, through the County Health Department. Keep on to the next slide, please. Here's our by zip code um, numbers here for you, breakdown. Um, if there's other ways that you wanna see this data, council members, let us know. We're trying to bring you it in the most digestible way for your districts. Um, next. Slide, please. Rachel, do you want me to do this one? Sure. This is. I just kept this in here just in case you needed a quick reminder on why we bring the wastewater surveillance system data to you and the website where you can find it. Um, it's really the leading trend that we're trying to pay attention to now as the indicator of what's to come with this virus. You want me to keep going? Sure. I just think it's such a cool tool. Oh, it's a very cool tool. It's a very cool tool. Yes. Yeah. You could switch to the next slide, please. So um, I left the map in from the last time uh, you met, April 19th, and today, it's sort of hard to tell here, but there's slightly less red and a little bit more yellow. So you saw, again, that increase we were seeing for a few weeks. Now it seems like it's leveling out. And again, like all things being equal, um, these numbers are still really like dramatically lower than what we saw during the peak of the pandemic. So if you go to the next slide, it dials in a little bit on, um, a little bit more deeply on the Salt Lake City um, wastewater. And that demonstrates it a little bit more clearly where you see that line that's really leveling out. Well, when you say it dives in deeper into the wastewater, it just conjures a... a <laughs> Thank you for a, pointing that out. A 12-year-old boy. <laughs> And I just want to just remind people uh, back in the, the day of January and December when Omicron was hitting, the numbers went up to 4,000 plus, and we're still under 100 here. Yep. So that is nice to know. Yeah, really good. You see here that the Salt Lake City 
um, is, is showing that COVID, of course, is present, but there's no real trend to report right now. And the next slide, if you could go there, is just a quick summary of what you just mentioned, Council Chair. Um, essentially that we are, sorry, I'm having trouble pulling it up on my computer, so I'll try to read it up here. So yeah, so the peaks have been well above 4,000 and right now we're, we're actually down a little bit over the last 14 days, back down to 76 million gene copies. Um, and even though we were seeing these, some increasing numbers of reported cases, that's not necessarily the most reliable figure, but um, wanted to just call that to your attention in case you hear that elsewhere. Compared with, or coupled with the wastewater data, it still is looking pretty stable here. And that one in three residents in the city have been infected since the beginning of the pandemic. It's a, an alarming number with a, a total estimated loss of 4,747 residents. Any questions on the COVID data? Okay, I think next we have community engagement. Hi, council members, thanks for having me. I'm Ava Lopez. I'm one of the community liaisons that gets to serve in Mayor Mendenhall's administration. I represent District 4 and in substitute District 3 at the moment. Uh, with our next slide, if we could go to it, please. On this slide, for constituents that are listening in, they can leave any feedback on projects that we have. Um, these are also the contacts on our community outreach team. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have our updates from our transportation department. Our master plan is being overhauled for the first time since 1996. Uh, so this is really great. We're gonna be able to carry our transportation vision and values of our capital city over the next four decades. Uh, it's being dubbed the Connect SLC. It's our new high-level policy document that's gonna guide the implementation of our future projects across all modes of transportation. Uh, it's gonna include vehicular, public transit, pedestrian, and bicycle access. Next slide, please. Here we have our public utilities updates. So we have our watershed management plan update, our next stakeholder meeting. It's both online and in person for those that wanna tune in. And it's gonna be talking about our human impact on the watershed. It's Friday, May 6th at 10 a.m. to noon in the City Council work meeting room. Along with our State Street water line, it's gonna be between, that project is happening between First Avenue and 200 North. And we're working to begin our key intersection of State Street and North Temple. Uh, replacing, this is gonna be replace a 100 plus year old water main line and sewage line rehab. Uh, we're also working closely with traffic detour information, make sure that people know uh, how to reroute around uh, these streets. And that work's gonna keep continuing until late August. Uh, so you can look at, uh, you can go online to statestreetwaterline.com to get any updates there. Along with our water reclamation facility project, on May 26th, we're gonna have an in-person open house at Rose Park Elementary, and June 1st has a Zoom online meeting. We can provide that link later if you'd like it. Our first open houses are beginning since the beginning of COVID, um, and we'll be sending out invites and outreach through social media, utility bills, newspaper advertising, and uh, other community council engagement there as well as our proposed utility rate increases. Uh, so these rate increases will provide that information for city and suburban customers. It's gonna be printed out and mailed later on this month, or excuse me, this week, and we have a 15% increase proposed for city customers that include water, sewer, and storm water rates. Uh, for customers outside the city, that 15% increase will also be in the water rates. Uh, next slide, please. And for sustainability, we have our electric vehicle ready ordinance. And the open public comment period has begun for the proposed uh, electric vehicle readiness ordinance. And notice was recently sent to community councils. The comment period is open through June 13th. The proposal will then go to planning commission in July. Sustainability hopes to transmit the ordinance to the city council for consideration after the new fiscal year. Okay, I think that's the end of my updates. Thank you. Thanks, Ava. So um, next slide starts our weekly homelessness update. This is the 
chart we normally give you regarding the occupancy. And um, you'll see, or you may notice there, that at the Men's Resource Center um, this, this past week, we had lower than normal occupancy rates. And um, that is, while that is true, 100% of those beds were reserved for those nights, but with the weather warming, many of the um, people who had reserved beds for, the, for that night ended up finding other locations to stay. So that's, um, I think, a trend that tends to happen as the weather stays nice. So Andrew wanted me to make sure that that was clear based on this slide. But other than that, you're, of course, seeing pretty full occupancy each night. Um, next slide, please. As I'm sure you know, Victory Road, the Victory Road location was cleaned last week. This was a, a pretty big endeavor. Um, there was a lot of advanced work done, and ultimately it, we, it was reported that were, there were about 35 individuals who were staying in that camp, um, which had decreased over the weeks prior due to outreach and advance notice that that location would be cleaned, um, mainly due to fire danger and other uh, environmental issues that come up when there's a large um, human presence in the in the foothills. So initial estimates are at least 30 dump truck loads of uh, debris removed and just waste. Um, so still waiting to kind of get a final after action report on that. There will be further follow up there in the coming weeks because um, people will return to that area, and again, for fire danger and other reasons, that area is of higher concern for the health department and, the, and our fire department as well. Um, there are some smaller cleanups scheduled throughout the city this week in the abatement world. Um, upcoming outreach events, there's a resource fair next Friday. The location is still TBD. There's a new another kayak court date Friday, May 20th on the river. This may be one of the kayak, bike, hybrid events, so I'm sure Andrew can give us more information on that next week. And then, of course, there's always the access emergency shelter number that we like to show every week just for continuity. And the last slide there, um, the rapid intervention team, which we originally had brought to you in the fall, um, this is moving. It's been there, there's been a few moving parts in terms of trying to get a, the right equipment, get staff hired, et cetera. But um, we're working through those issues and reporting some progress now. Hart and our public services department are finalizing how they will work together jointly on this effort. And again, this is um, the intention here is to help respond more quickly when there are uh, impacts related to unsheltered camping in front of residents or businesses or in neighborhoods so that um, you know we're not waiting for health department and uh, advantage services etc to um, come together to do those so this is trying to put more of that in in the control of the city to be able to respond more quickly both with first outreach and then second the ability to take equipment and clean and have you know the right the right people and protocols in place to make sure that those locations are clean, safe, and open for everyone in the public. So um, this is just a quick introduction to that, and as we get that program more up and running, we'll be happy to come back and talk more. Could you give expand on the uh, HART program, just HART, who they are? Oh, yeah, sorry, acronym. Um, so that's our homeless engagement and outreach team that works in the Housing Stability Department or division here. Uh, through community and neighborhoods. So Michelle Hoon and her team, in other words. Thank you. Did you have a good? Rachel, so um, the last time I, I remember we used Advantage Services for the cleanups, and now you said that you're not going to do that? We will still be using okay. that contract, and Michelle is on here, so if I'm getting something wrong, I hope she'll chime in. But um, we still will be taking it, using that Advantage Services contract, but this is a way for us to um, be able to have equipment on hand and okay. and kind of keep that function more quickly and more nimble. In so the city. it's a yes and approach. Oh, okay, it's a yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But but maybe, maybe we do find out that it's easier if we do it instead of contracting out. You know, that's a 
good data to have, you know. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or anything else we can report back on next week? We really appreciate this time to update you on the outreach opportunities that are happening and our day-to-day -day work on COVID declining, hopefully, but homelessness too, and crime from time to time. Thanks. No, I appreciate this uh, update every time. It's, it's wonderful. So thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Rachel, thank you. Ava, great to see you. Thank you. We'll be moving on to item number two, uh, ordinance budget amendment number seven for fiscal year 2021 to 22, uh, follow up. And we have uh, been with us in person, Mary Beth Thompson, the CFO, John Voigt, and Lisa McCarver. Oh, there's Mary Beth. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, this is the second briefing on budget amendment number seven. The public hearing is scheduled for tonight. The responses to the council's questions from April 19th were not available in time for publishing the staff report. We have listed them in the staff report. They're about a new road to the regional athletic complex, 900 South and 1300 East reconstruction projects, and then updates to the impact fees plan. So when we get those responses, we'll be sure to share them with the council. And a, a note for reference, at the bottom of page two and, or excuse me, bottom of page one and top of page two is the list of items uh, earlier iterations of the council have requested to be added or considered for updating the impact fees plan. So if you have an idea and you want it to be considered for the update to the impact fees plan, it may already be on the list, but let me know if it's not there. There are two items in section D and two council added items that I'll review. The first is D11, a request for $482,000 from vacancy savings in the police department. And it would be for supplies and improvements to the new Community Connections Center or the CCC. This is where the social worker program in the police department operates out of. In the last annual budget, the council approved $200,000 for a new location, and this was intentionally flexible funding for utilities, remodels, repairs, and paying the lease. A lease has been signed for a new location, and $167,000 is encumbered under that agreement and the remaining $33,000 is being used for building improvements, but that's only enough for 10% of the estimated costs. So the administration is requesting $320,000 for additional building improvements to the new location. And this includes security upgrades, Wi-Fi, connectivity improvements, as well as some electrical wiring, and then the actual costs of moving the program. Since the last location for the CCC was closed, they've been operating out of the public safety building, which places certain limits on their ability to help walk-in clients and schedule appointments. The request also includes $90,000 to the fleet fund for two new vehicles for the social workers, $52,000 for uniforms, radios, and another $52,000 that would go to IMS for computers, mobile data terminals, and trainings. The new location is expected to be open later this year. It was hoped to be this summer, but given supply chain delays, it may be pushed back to the fall. Three policy questions if the council's interested. Uh, you could ask the administration to evaluate this ongoing leasing cost for inclusion and be eligible in the impact fee plan for police impact fees. This would be similar to an earlier version of the plan where police impact fees were able to pay the leasing cost in part for the crime lab. The other two questions are updates on efforts to bring the CCC to full staffing 
There are 19 social worker FTEs that are fully funded and approved. And the last, how the public, clients, and service providers will learn about the new location. Yeah, please, yeah. please ask those questions. I like them. Thank you. Okay. And if there's nothing else on that item, that takes us to D13. This is also a request to use vacancy savings in the police department. It's $383,000 for additional mobile surveillance trailer cameras. And attachment one has photos if you wanted to see what these look like. Um, they're solar powered and the camera extends vertically over the trailer. And then there are multiple cameras at the top pointed in different directions. The 383,000 would pay for eight additional trailer cameras. The department currently has six. So this would give them 14 in total, which would be enough to have two in each council district. The cameras are usually placed on public property. They are occasionally placed on private property with the owner's permission and for case specific reasons. There's three policy questions. First is, if you'd like to ask the administration where the trailer cameras are most effective and how the department prioritizes where to place them. Next is, would you like to learn more about privacy considerations, such as what protections are in place for the video and the audio data that's created? And last is why trailer cameras are preferable to the pole cameras. These are fixed cameras that can be attached to street lights. Seeing nods. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, I I wanted just to mention that uh, I I talked a lot with the administration and with the, with the chief about this, uh, and you know it is my belief uh, that they are positive uh, for my district at least, and they curve. Uh, in, in, you know, the, the appearance of crime and the, the, the crime issues that we have in North Temple and every time that the police was able to place one, this, uh, you know, drug market sometimes that are happening on North Temple just disappear or just move. So I was asking the, the police chief for, for more of this uh, in, in this area and, uh, you know, I believe that this is a response to that. Oh, go ahead, Councilor Valdemos. Yeah, when do we, I'm sorry if I missed it, do we have like a proposal on when, where this are going to be located or how it's going to be decided on where? So I don't have an answer to where they would be located, um, but that is one of the policy questions we'll follow up on is what is that prioritization process? Okay. I assume that if this is approved, the vote is on May 17th, that the police department would want to order them as soon as possible. I don't know if this is one of the, the items experiencing delays in delivery, though. I see. Okay. Because I do agree with um, Council Member Pui. Like, it, it does deter crime. I've seen it also on 2nd East, uh, sorry, as in 2nd South, 2nd uh, East area when we have those in there. And I've also seen when patrols are parked in a certain area, then also that dissipates the crime also 7th South and 2nd East as an example. So I'm excited that to hear if it's, you know, that we can get those and also uh, I want to pitch in District 4 to, <laughs> to be one, some, you know, the locations for it as well as District 2. So thanks. Thanks. It's my understanding that they would be, that there was a proposal at one point that they would be sort of split up between council districts. So each council district had a certain number. And while that makes sense in some ways, I also think that crime moves around the city in a way that is not within council districts. So uh, I would advocate for a little bit more flexibility for the department to put them where there is actually crime hotspots happening, which may be more than, more in one district than the other. So I, I, I would advocate for more flexibility for the department in placing those. I would like to second that. We might be able to have a say in that. I'd like to 
I'd like to encourage us to make sure that we're reviewing our criteria for what makes it appropriate to put one in a place, when it's appropriate for us to remove it, who can monitor the data collected by it, just to make sure that we are staying on the right side of the reasonable right to privacy for our citizens. But it is a very effective tool. Cindy. Uh, and Ben raised it as a policy question, uh, but it is one of those things that um, is largely administrative. Uh, but the point that you're making, what we, what we could do is ask the police department how they handle those things. So we could follow up with that, right? With that, there's two more items. They're both council added items. This is section I. The first one is a raise grant uh, match. Raise is an acronym because we're dealing with the federal government. It's rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and equity. It's a planning grant administered by the US Department of Transportation. The funding is from the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law. This item would add $1.24 million from funding our future revenues that are coming in above budget this fiscal year. The study, if it's awarded the grant money, would look at multiple potential infrastructure changes to improve the east-west transportation in the city, and this is across multiple modes of transportation. The additional funding would bring the city's local match to approximately 20% of the total requested funding, and this is to make the application more competitive. If, the, if this item is approved, funding our future revenues would still be estimated at $3.1 million above budget this fiscal year. The other council added item, number two, is transferring $10 million from fund balance, this is a one-time transfer, into a holding account in the CIP fund. This means the funding would not lapse to fund balance at the end of the current fiscal year. And the approach preserves options for further discussion and information on how to use the funds at a later date. And that is everything I have for Budget Amendment 7. Thank you, Ben. Uh, any, any questions? Go ahead. Is the 20% match enough to make us competitive, or are we still having to compete with other people putting more up? I defer to the administration on that. Uh, I'm not sure what are all the factors that make an application more or less competitive. Local matching dollars have been signaled by the U.S. Department of Transportation as a significant factor. I don't know if this is maxing out um, and what the other factors are. We can certainly ask. May I, Mayor, do you have a? If my memory is right, I think we got up to about 21.5% match on that grant request, and that is very competitive. It's a little bit more, obviously, than the 20% that is of uh, recommended number and it's I think over the years it's been typical that we bring a much lower sometimes very very much lower than a 20% match to federal applications so this is I think probably the biggest match I've seen the city put on the table for a big transportation grant so fingers crossed yeah this is this write right letters to DOT right. this is trans yeah it's a big deal. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mary Beth. All right, Council, we'll be moving on to item number three. It's the fiscal year 2022-23 proposed budget Salt Lake City Public Library System. Ben's remaining at the, at the table. And Mary Beth is going to come back to the table, I think. Maybe not. Debbie, there's Debbie. And Jay Spunting. Thank you. Okay. 
I've got a short intro, Mr. Chair, and then um, the library board president is planning to join, um, I think, in 15 or 20 minutes. So he may get here partway through the discussion. Uh, he's going to come in virtually? Yeah, join virtually. The proposed library budget is attachment one to the staff report. The organizational chart is on page five. If you want to see the staffing breakout, it is on pages eight and nine. And the revenue and expenditure details are on pages 10 through 13. The library board sets the policy for the library and the council reviews and approves the budget as well as sets the tax rate for the library. The library board unanimously approved the proposed budget on April 25th. At the time of publishing the staff report, the mayor was reviewing the board's proposed budget and could recommend adjustments from what's in attachment one. The proposed budget is $28.5 million. This is 4 million or 16% more than last year. Now that increase includes a property tax increase of $2.8 million. The last library tax increase was five years ago, and it was to cover the ongoing operating costs and some of the debt payments related to the Marmalade and Glendale branch libraries. The budget also includes $697,000 to establish a temporary physical presence in the ballpark neighborhood. Most of the new revenue would pay for an increase in full-time employees, FTEs. There would be 18 new FTEs in the fiscal year 23 proposed budget. And that would bring the total library staffing to 241 FTEs. On the last page of the staff report, there is a chart and a corresponding data table which shows the staffing levels and the overall budget for the library since 2016. So if you wanna take a look at the growth during that time, that's a good place to look. Uh, and one more thing important to note, the budget includes $2 million, which would fill the remaining gap for a repair and redevelopment of the main library roof. So this would be a $4 million total project and it would have some significant changes to that location. And with that intro, I'll turn it over to the interim executive director. Um, my board chair, Adam Weinecker, is planning to join us at three, and so he's going to probably be reiterating a little bit of what um, Ben just shared with you, but I'll start out with my comments, and um, bear with me as I'm probably gonna read through because I have a lot to cover to share with you today. Um, Feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, Jay Bunting, our finance manager, is here as well, and we can, he can answer any of those more complex budget questions for you. Um, so thank you all for letting us be here today and presenting our fiscal year 23 budget. Um, throughout the past year, our organization has been working with the library board, library staff, and the community to develop a new mission statement. Your City Library, Building a Foundation of Equity, Connection, and limit, Limitless Possibilities, should define who the library is at its core and how we desire to move forward as a people-focused organization. We are committed to providing equitable and life-affirming library services to our community. We believe that the budget we are presenting today will support the aspirations and goals of our mission. I'd like to now share the priorities of the budget as well as provide some context about future initiatives and projects that we'll be focusing on in fiscal year 23. Um, slide two, Ben. So um, retaining funding for COLA, longevity, so cost of living, longevity pay, and the compensation, compensation study as the budget book outlines on page six for staff is our top priority. We are committed to compensating our staff fairly especially now with the inflationary pressures affecting the cost of living and impacting the overall economic well-being of staff. It's also important for our organization to stay competitive in the job market. We want to recruit and retain an exceptional workforce. Slide three. 
Our second priority, which is uh, described on page eight and nine in the budget book, is the addition of new positions to support existing staff so they are able to better serve our community. Over the last five years, our public services staff have been increasingly asked to respond to our community's critical needs and, and around um, homeless, mental health, and substance abuse issues. Many of our patrons need direct social services interventions. And this work takes an emotional and sometimes physical toll on those responding directly to often difficult and sometimes threatening situations. Our staff are compassionate people without formal social services training who are called upon daily to seek solutions and problem solve with our social services partners to secure assistance outside the realm of traditional library work. In response to building a robust and supportive framework, we are requesting new positions for several services. To cover the range of issues we face in ensuring our spaces are safe and welcoming to the public, we are requesting support in three key areas, safety, a licensed clinical social worker and custodial support. We must make certain that all patrons feel welcome and safe within our branches. By adding safety associates, we will address the growing need and provide more consistent branch coverage. Aside from specializing in de-escalating difficult situations, we are also ensuring this team is trained as EMTs to be able to provide quality first responder care in medical situations. To help address root causes issues that lead to these moments of crisis, we are adding a licensed clinical social worker. This position will manage and develop our network of partners to help us connect vulnerable populations to better and more consistent care, provide training, expertise, and support to our staff, and help us navigate more difficult situations. And to ensure that our spaces are also clean, safe, and welcoming, we need additional janitorial staff. Those roles will help us make sure our spaces meet the standards of all our community members. We also are looking at other ways to support hiring and day-to-day -day people management of our organization, and we are requesting additional staff in human resources. Our human resource department is currently consists of three full-time equivalent positions, well, three people, <laughs> including the manager, and we employ 334 people. 146 are full-time, 129 are part-time, and 59 are substitutes. Over the past few years, we've been increasing our full-time positions and decreasing our part-time to be able to offer benefits and be more competitive in our field. We are also requesting three full-time assistant managers. The fourth assistant manager position that you would see in the budget book uh, is in the technology and digital, digital equity department and requires no new funding since there's currently funding available for an open position in that department. Um, these requested positions present opportunities for growth for our staff as well as support managers in their day-to-day -day work. These assistant managers will allow time for the managers to prioritize strategic outcomes for their locations. So we are requesting assistant managers for two of our busiest branches, Anderson, Foothill, and Sprague. We are also requesting an assistant manager for the ballpark location who will supervise a staff of 3.8 FTE. This position will report to a manager working out of another branch location. We are also seeing incre increasingly diverse set of needs related to marketing and translation, IT support, and internal procurement practices. And so we are also requesting positions um, in marketing so that we can market to our diverse communities. We're seeing more demand for Spanish tran tran translation for our signage and our marketing materials. We also want to provide an additional staff member to our IT department by extending the hours that they are available to help our staff in support of the, the patrons who come into the library. Our staff provide technology services to a wide range of customers with multiple technology needs from you know, the very highest need to sometimes um, very simple um, basic needs for using technology. The IT team troubleshoots software and hardware issues in both public services and support services. And we are requesting a procurement officer to facilitate and manage our vendor relationships, the process for bids and requests for proposals, ongoing service contracts, and overall compliance with the library's um, purchasing policy. So as Ben mentioned, these additional requested positions are a main driver for a request to increase the certified tax rate. As, as Adam will share with you <laughs> again, uh, to fully fund the requested 18.3 FTE positions, we require an almost $2.8 million tax increase in fiscal year 23. Are there any questions on this part of my presentation before I move on? No? Okay. I'd also like to take a few minutes to review the master facilities plan, the ballpark neighborhood library presence, 
fiscal year 23 capital projects and an update on the executive director search. So during the library's master facilities plan development, workshops were held with staff, the community, and with um, city government staff who attended some of the workshops. Um, slide four, Ben. This work identified the ballpark neighborhood as one of the four areas in the city that lacks easily accessible library services. The MFP recommends alternative sprout locations to better reach underserved populations and to meet our strategic goals in serving Salt Lake City. One of these facility types could be a leased temporary library space that would allow the library to conduct robust community engagement to plan a possible future permanent library presence. Slide five, Ben. The identified gap in the ballpark neighborhood along with forward movement around the ballpark station area plan has accelerated the timeline to explore and implement a possibly leased presence in the ballpark area by the library. Therefore, we've included a temporary ballpark library location as our third priority in the fiscal year 23 budget. To accomplish this, we are requesting an increase in the general fund budget, as Ben mentioned, of $697,600. $435,600 of that number is requested as an addition to the library's tax revenue increase to operate the new location, which would include the hiring of 4.8 new full-time equivalent employees, to staff the location, $90,000 for a lease or rental um, um, requirements, plus smaller amounts for utilities, snow removal, you know, all those things that are needed in caring for a, a location. And then the remaining 262,000 would be provided from the library's fund balance and would cover modifications to a temporary site, furnishings, and provide circulating materials at that location. Do these that the hours are going to be basically the same as the other? No, we, we, that's why we have a smaller team of people. We were looking, um, we were thinking right now that we would do Monday through Saturday, 12 until 6. That could have some wiggle room, but, but overall we're looking at more 40 hours open, and currently I think our branch locations are open about 56 hours. We have some limited hours right now because as we've been coming out of COVID, we're not uh, doing what, what our full-time normal regular hours have been. And right now it's still not quite settled in at 6 p.m. being the closing time. I'm just thinking. Right. Of this, we the, could the, look at like the, being open, you know, one, one or two evenings a week. Again, we were hoping to use this location to also help us explore and understand what is needed in the neighborhood and what people could really benefit from. And sorry, this is my ignorance of libraries. Do you have enough libraries in, in circulation to uh, supply that library with enough books so that you're not buying another whole set of books? Well, it, we don't view it as a very large location, so okay. we, we're viewing it as maybe like a space between 15 to 1600 to 3000 square feet, which maybe the actual public space would be closer to, you know, 16 or so, 100, sorry, I said that wrong, 1600 square feet. Um, if, you can imagine, if you can kind of picture where, when we were at the um, Firehouse Express Library, when we were renovating Sprague, something kind of along those lines. Jason, we, we've built $100,000 into, into the 262 for that collection of that area. We'd really want to focus on really probably high demand um, browsable materials and then rely on our other locations to bring in materials that people hold. Thank you. Um, other identified master facilities priorities are the Anderson Foothill Branch, which currently is undergoing an engineering site analysis to inform future plans for that location, and then the Day Riverside Branch in the Rose Park neighborhood, which we view as a hub for the west side to offer expanded services that can't be implemented at other west side locations due to their um, space limitations. The renovation and repair of the main library is also one of the the top um, priorities identified in the master facilities plan, and it'll require a future implementation plan, uh, we feel, that will break this project into smaller segments. We hope to acquire funding to implement all or part of our master facility plan recommendation, or 10-year plan recommendations in the next two to three years to, to help fund that. Um, and then si slide six. So the main library roof repair and redesign renovation, we've got a few renderings here, is slated to begin this summer. The anticipated timeline for completion is late fall of 2023. Um, public engagement and feedback of the proposed plan will begin the week of May 15th. 
Our community engagement and customer experience teams worked with the design team and our facilities team to open the roof to the public until construction begins. So we're hoping to be open pretty much all summer to let people get out onto the roof again. And then we're also going to uh, gather feedback from those rooftop visitors using a variety of methods to include dot voting, survey forms, intercepts, and other human-centered design research techniques. And then along with the roof repair project, we have a number of capital projects planned for the budget year, and they're outlined on page 19 of the budget book. And any questions around that? Cindy? Go ahead, Cindy. Um, and I have not looked at this myself. This was just a couple of comments that we'd had in the office from constituents, but um, the um, idea of some of the replacements or repairs, significant repairs on some of your structures, was it looked at in terms of what is essential to get done or was it looked at in terms of what would be ideal to get done? I, I think it's a mix of both. I have Gordon Bradbury here, here who's our uh, facilities as assistant director, but my, um, my understanding in, uh, in reviewing the plan and, and thinking about it a lot is that we looked at some essential items um, that um, the building, believe it or not, is almost 20 years old. It'll be 20 years old in February of 2023. And um, it, it's had a lot of vi visitors over those 20 years. And so we are looking at some like more infrastructure, um, uh, HVAC, um, fire suppression system, issues that have just had wear and tear on them as the years mm -hmm. have passed. And then probably more of those soft uh, furnishing features, you sure. know, that just things like woodworking furnishings that have just kind of taken a toll over the mm -hmm. years. We also realized that that building um, was designed over 20 years ago, and the way that people use libraries and the way that we also work with um, the community in our libraries has changed a bit. So one thing we've noticed is that people are al always asking for additional meeting room space, um, study room space. And while we have a series of kind of like open space, you know, in that one curved wall, it um, doesn't always give people the privacy that they would like for study or group <laughs> study and uh, or small group meeting. So we're looking at ways that we could better accommodate that by maybe glassing in some. I mean, interestingly, the way the building was designed, it allows us to kind of do those um, renovations and changes, so that's nice. Um, just looking at how we utilize the first floor space, um, if you've been over there lately, our creative lab's kind of in the back of that space, and it would be nice to kind of bring it more front and center because it's it's a really great resource for the community and not everybody knows it's it's back there. And I so I understand that deferred maintenance and those, those things that you have to do to maintain the structures. Uh, there was a couple of the questions related to, it seemed like, uh, once, and this could be totally off, but once a building was 20 years old, there was a thought that, it, well, perhaps it should be replaced or, or perhaps it should be really totally redone. And in government, we, of course, have to make things last longer than that. And so I, uh, you're, you're not thinking in the, so that was a misperception then, okay. Yeah, and, okay. and honestly, I think my recollection is when that building opened, you know, the goal is that it could last 50 or more years, right, with some renovations in between. Are you talking about the main, main library? library? Well, all of our locations. I mean, Chapman's over 100 now, so. Yeah. Um, and I think um, with this roof, repair and renovation and kind of re rethinking of using the space. I mean, what kind of drove that was that there just needed to be a number of repairs that are kind of buried under concrete. And to be honest with you, that library has leaked since the day we opened in February 2003. And so we, we needed we need to address it. Um, we've, we've put money to try to re do Band-Aid approaches, but this, this new um, reset and redesign and just looking at the repairs we feel is going to hold us a good 40 years into the future with that space so no we are not thinking of pulling down that beautiful building no, and rebuilding one, it but I I someone mentioned the um, district one library and the district six libraries as as possible replacements but there are a lot of people in the yes. community that think of them as new Right. Well, Anderson Foothill was built in 1985, and as I said, we're having some engineer, we're having an engineering firm look at some of the structural issues on the site that we're, we've encountered over the years. And then um, Day Riverside was, I think it was opened in 1995, 96. 
So, um, and it, it isn't necessarily a full rebuild on that one. Um, we kind of think Foothill may require it just based on some of the issues that we know are happening with the structure of, of that site. So just the point that a lot of times we have to, in order to make the dollars go far enough, we, we aren't able to do as big a project. So we have to look for the ones that are the most essential to preserve the buildings. And so I was not sure if that was where you guys were coming from. Thanks. Yes, it is. Thank you, Cindy. And just on that, maybe you'll get to there. Uh, let me know. Just on the uh, number of uh, visitors, are they back to the, are they getting back to the days before? Well, back to 2019 days or 2018 days or are you seeing an increase? We're seeing an uptick at all of our locations and usage. Um, and we do, I do have a few numbers and they're a combination of like even 2020, 2021 when we were closed on and off due to the pandemic. But we've had almost um, uh, 805,000. Well, look at it this way. We had 85,000 curbside holds to go pick up. So maybe people weren't able to come into the library, but they were still picking up either their holds that they placed um, on materials or we, had, we offered prints to go services, so some people don't have printers at home, so we could print things for them. And we also offered browsing to go, where people could kind of like send in their requests that they wanted a particular type of book that they were looking for, and then our staff would kind of curate them, bring together the books, and put them on the hold shelf. So just over the, the two years, we had 85,000 curbside hold visits, so holds to go pick up. Um, but we are seeing more people coming in. We're, we're feeling that we're, we're busy. I overheard one of our Volunteers of America staff say today that they're seeing like 70 to 80 people daily just coming into the main library asking for their services. And then of course we aren't back to our full in-person services such as story times and other programming, but we're working towards that. We wanted to kind of see with younger children to see where we're at the vaccination. Um, uh, the amount of kids who can be vaccinated before we bring them into larger crowds, but we have supplemented that with um, lots of online virtual programming. And we are also supporting meeting room space, particularly for community councils virtually. Yeah, I know that the couple community councils are going, do they switch back and forth? Do they go all in person? So they're all discussing um, that now. Yeah, we just started taking um, on uh, meeting room use reservations um, the 4th and implementing them um, April 18th, so slowly. But I think some folks are finding that they're having better results doing virtual meetings with attendance. So we're also working at hybrid options as you offer here. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? related to that. Okay, and then I'll, I'll just kind of finish up with slide seven, our executive um, director search. Um, as many of you know, as I was introduced, I'm the inter interim executive director, um, but we are planning an executive director search. We have a core committee of people working on that right now. Um, three members of the executive leadership team, uh, our HR manager, myself, and our equity um, and organizational management um, organizational development manager. Um, and then we have three board members who are currently the core committee. We're working on um, putting out an RFP uh, to accept proposals for an executive search firm, we hope by May 15th. And then we hope to be under contract with a search firm by September 15th. And then based on their, their feedback and guidance, begin the process of looking for an executive director. And that is all I've got for today. I'm not sure if um, Adam has jumped in, but I think maybe I covered a lot of stuff that he was going to talk about anyway. I, I can, can you hear me okay? Oh, I just, there you are, oh, Adam. there you are. If we can, yeah. I am can. a little late. I apologize for that. Oh, hello, Adam. Hello, I'm, and I'm, I'm also having a little feedback issue for it with the volume, but it sounds like Debbie did an amazing job. She did. Thank you. Any other questions for Debbie in the library? Well, thank you very much. All right, well, thank appreciate you very that. much. We appreciate your time today. All right, thank you very much. Hey, Ben. And we're moving on to item number four, informational on the Glendale Regional Park Master Plan update. I have Allison on the screen. I have Kristen. I saw Kristen and Rikers here, Nancy Monteith and Catherine Moss. I don't is. I got Kristen. We'll take 
Kristen, and we got Allison on the screen. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. As you mentioned, this is an informational update on the Glendale Regional Park Master Plan. It's one of those mid-process updates that uh, the council has and request from administrative staff. And so Kristen and her team will be preparing a, will be presenting a uh, presentation briefly uh, in a few minutes. Essentially, in a nutshell, the Department of Public Lands is preparing to repurpose the former site of the Glendale Water Park. The process so far has included site analysis, conceptual planning, and extensive public engagement. There is a special construction schedule required for this site because it was originally funded by the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is part of the National Park Service. And active, essentially active recreation must be publicly accessible on site by April 2024. And I'm sure Kristen and her team will have more detail about that. Finally, um, in terms of the final version of this master plan, it's anticipated to be ready for the for potential council adoption by the fall of 2022. In other words, just a few more months. And it's intended to guide the city's future capital improvements, site programming, operations, and maintenance recommendations. The full cost estimate for implementation of the master plan will be included in that final version. There are a number of policy questions in the staff report. Uh, regarding which uh, resident body might be the best choice for presenting uh, the final version before it is presented to the council. Um, currently, the, the uh, department plans to present it to the city's planning commission, but I know the council has, has uh, considered some different options for for these kinds of plans, including, for example, the city's parks, trails, natural lands, and urban forestry advisory board, or PNET. Um, other questions include the role of the current community advisory committee once the master plan is adopted. Um, some, some technical questions regarding the timing of how things are going to play out in the um, in terms of the completion of this master plan versus when actual amenities for phase one of the master plan have to be have to start being planned for. And then finally, how the new Glendale Regional Park will complement the existing Glendale neighborhood park. So you may wish to refer to those and I will turn the time over to Kristen and her team. Kristen. Hi, Council. Hi, Chair. Um, as you can see, my team is not here. <laughs> and um, I think you're a little early. Is there any way we could give them 30 minutes? Is there any way we could come back? Or I can try to present this on my own. Nancy said she would try to sign on. She was just leaving her house to come here. How would you like to handle that? You know, if we can do that, we can, I think we can move on to the, uh, since we got Ben, well, if we could grab Ben, we could do the redistricting. Yeah. Well, We'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll take a, uh, I think we need to take a, a five minute uh, break right now. We'll take a five minute break, return in five minutes with the redistricting, and then we should be back on time. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate that. It. Sure.
little bit and we're going to move on to item number seven, which is the resolution redistricting city council district boundaries follow up. And at the table we have Ben to lead the uh, discussion here. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This is the seventh briefing on redistricting and a vote on the redistricting map is scheduled for May 10th, next Tuesday. And I just wanted to give an update. The redistricting website, it's a tinyurl.com forward slash SLC redistricting. Uh, we just checked the numbers this morning and there have been over 2,000 visitors. Uh, that's one of the highest visitation rates we've had for project websites. So it's nice to see the public is watching. Scott, would you put up the color-coded table on page one? That's it. Uh, so this is a color-coded table. It summarizes council member feedback that we gathered on an individual basis, and it's as of April 28th. So if it changed, let us know. The, the map has the names of the six recommended maps from the advisory commission on the top row, the last name of council members on the left most column. The top preferences are listed with the number one and color coded green. The least preferred are listed as a six and color coded red. And the preferences in between are yellow and orange. And if a council member did not prefer a map at all and didn't want uh, to assign it a preference, it's purple and has NA listed. So we, we gathered this uh, feedback individually and we wanted to share it for uh, informing your discussions today. Since the last meeting you talked about uh, wanting to focus on one map and this could help uh, if you still wanted to pick one map to focus on. Council, any comments starting off? Councilmember How did Councilmember Pui not choose a second but chose a third? <laughs> <laughs> I do have an explanation for that. Yes. Um, I have my own map uh, as number two, um, which is, uh, it is not, uh, it's a spin off from my number one map. Uh, it's just the only, there are very minimal changes. Um, there are some silly things that I, they, they don't change population, and I don't understand why they, they picked them to become a different part of a council district, but I, the, the major difference between uh, that one and mine is that I'm not using the, the freeway as the major divider between your district, um, or your district, you know, and mine. Um, so I just, just as, it's more of symbolic than anything else, but I think it will, it, it's something that would, I believe we should do. I think with that comment, which is, I like where you're going, because there was, I think other people may have decided or may uh, believe that taking one map and making some subtle changes is uh, the right way to go. But that description with a map may be a lot easier for us to understand. So I look at that and I go, hey, it's pretty obvious that uh, the politely compact has got all ones except for Councilmember Monos and the two. So if, if it would be uh, if agreeable to the other council members if we just brought up map number one, and then Councilmember Pui can discuss what he was just talking about, and then if there's any other ideas, just kind of st start there. Any? Um, Mr. Chair, before we jump into that, I wonder if Ben or Cindy can explain the thing that we were talking about with voting districts, just so that council members have that, because I wasn't aware of that when I was kind of playing around with the tool. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and this really is um, something that, that we have done in the uh, past, and we had a miscommunication this time, so we're dealing with an imperfect situation right now, but uh, the state completes their drawing, and then based on what they've drawn, the county prepares their voting district map, and then based on the voting district map, the cities then complete their district boundaries. Um, the county recorder is accommodating to to make um, some adjustments if necessary, or the alternate is to 
um, manage two different council districts within one voting district. Um, and that, that I think gets a little dicey. I don't know if it's really actually ever done, but, but um, the voting district is the unit that the county uses. What we used is the census blocks. And there's a lot of similarity to the boundaries, but the census blocks are not the size of voting districts. So, so there, are, there are lots of shared boundaries, but there are some cases where using the census blocks accidentally splits a voting district. And that just, that does create more work for the county recorder. Um, so it's not ideal, um, but the county recorder, I understand from our city recorder, is willing to work with us on that. Um, but just as, and I think, um, Ben, you have the uh, overlay of voting districts in your map for today. The voting precincts. Yep, voting precincts. Um, so we'll have that as a piece of information. If you are very anxious and want to have a boundary that doesn't follow those, then we can make that um, courtesy request of the of the county recorder. So that's just the background is that it's it's just um, in, in the order of things, typically we would do our best to follow those. And Cindy, how many districts at this time were affected or Ben can tell us there weren't many splits a few in the minimal changes map that it seems to be the preference so there's a, about 130 voting precincts and that map yeah it's, it's more than I think people realize and out of the 130 two of them are currently split and they're recommended on un unsplit I don't know if that's a word it takes them and moves them into one council district. So it removes a currently split council district in two instances. Those are both in Wasatch Hollow. And then on 900 South, it's recommended to move up to 800 South as the border. And there are, I believe, seven voting precincts along that boundary that would then be split by one block. Thank you, Cosmo, please. No, I, I just uh, this. I, it makes sense that we don't want to split, you know, these things. I, I just it, it, now I feel bad for the redistricting commission because I feel like this little piece of information was important for them to know, and I feel like now, you know, all their work and you know many meetings and arguments about this, uh, you know, while it seems to be that the changes will not be comp gigantic. I still feel like maybe yeah. we put it. We can put a pin for the next ten years. <laughs> Someone needs to right, be. right. Yeah, it's just a matter of uh, we did have a miscommunication, and um, just so you're aware of it, that we're we'll be asking our our county recorder to please help us on this. Um, so, and I just thought it's better to be aware of that than for us to not tell you. But in actuality, I mean, we had 130, and we did we're in single digits for. That we had like split, yeah. so we're, it's yeah. not like it's yeah. it's not like 120 of them are split, right? Right. So, so. Ben, where's the map of the ones that are split? Is that in our materials? So I can screen share the minimal district map if that works. Mm -hmm. So I'm joining the meeting in WebEx, and Scott, can you make me the presenter so I can screen share? Um, yes, you've been assigned presenter privileged. Okay. <laughs> so this is zoomed in to Wasatch Hollow and the the reddish pink lines are the current council boundaries. And the green lines are the voting precincts. 
So as you can see, the red is the current council boundaries. It goes between District 5, which is blue, and District 6, which is the orange color. And the, the blue color is what's recommended to be District 5 with these changes. So this voting precinct, instead of being split, would be entirely within District 5. And the same would be true with the adjacent voting precinct. And this would also take Wasatch Hollow, and it would divide it on 15th East instead of having the more jagged red lines that it currently has. What is the shift in population by moving this? So the shift in population, it is taking these. So it would be adding 380 residents to District 6. And it would be and it would be adding 626 to District 5. And as a reminder, Districts 2 and 5 are the ones that need to grow in size. They had too few residents with the 2020 census results, and District 4 needs to shrink. The other four districts were within the typical margin. That doesn't mean you can change them if you want, but they, they don't have to change based on the numbers. Mr. Chair? Um, I wonder if maybe I can just pose a couple policy questions to the council. I know that when we formed the redistricting committee, we declined to give them specific policy direction as to how to split up the, the maps. And maybe as a result, they gave us six, which is more than I think any of us anticipated. But one thing to me that this brings up, as well as that other split along 9th South or 8th South, plus what I believe Councilmember Pui was talking about, about symbolically not letting the freeway be a boundary, is that, to me, do we want our district, city council districts to be, um, to follow boundaries, or do we want to intentionally not let them follow the freeway? Because that's something that I've been interested in this whole time, is saying the freeway is already such a, a boundary between the east and the west side, Let's not also make political boundaries there. So then we have more council members that are responsible for West Side issues to a certain degree so that we have more eyes, more people advocating for things on both sides of the freeway and looking at it not as your city and my city, looking at it as one city. Um, and then also like the 8th to 9th South, pol me policy-wise, 9th South, we're putting so much money into the trail and redeveloping that so it's a walkable, sort of mixed use community, do we want to use that as a political boundary or do we say 8 South is the UDOT controlled road that always will be somewhat of a boundary, unfortunately, but 9 South is more of a street that connects both sides of that. So why not have that connected into one district? Uh, same goes with this Wasatch Hollow because that's right where 15th and 15th is, which is a smaller geographically, but still a mixed use sort of urban node. Do we want those to be included in one council district or separated? And I guess in my brain, we kind of want them all sort of, when they're, when they're a destination point, we want, kind of want those in one district. But when it's a, you know, sort of that big emotional mental boundary of the freeway, I would sort of want to blur that. So I'm not sure uh, where other council members are on that, but that sort of in, informs my decision on these. Councilman Ward. Um, I think we mostly should follow boundaries, um, but I think that there are times when we don't want to, like with the freeway. But I mean, we have to accept um, that there's no way to check every box. 
There, there is no perfect map. Um, and the, I think the goal is to check as many boxes as we can, um, not to check all of the boxes, because otherwise this is, we're not gonna get anywhere. And we do need to make a decision. That's what Vara was. I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Chris, and I feel like um, at least this council, uh, I think it's we're being pretty um, sympathetic with, you know, with the with that freeway, and I really don't feel like I don't care about the west side because that's where my, you know, I-15 switches. I've always just out of, you know. As a planner, I, I love to help all of you know all of the all, all of the neighborhoods, especially those that seem to be um, that had less attention. And so, to me, that's not that's not a good like I don't see that as a barrier like this political barrier to me to you know to help the West Side. So um, I know I saw some of the comments for the public, and some people were confused about the map or why we do maps or why District One and District Two were so big and just two people were representing it and hopefully those people are listening to this meeting but Ben mentioned earlier and we have to reiterate it's because about the size of the population of that so it might be big in geographically but not big in population and that's why they're so big and then two the second one was it was hard to see the the addresses I think um, and some of these maps, it's true, it was hard for me as well, so I wanna acknowledge that maybe we can figure out some of the the, um, the streets better for the public in a way so they can see where the new ones would be. And what else did you say? You had something, the last question was, uh, no, I think oh, the separation probably, yeah. on 8th South and 9th South. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Pichu. Well, and I think for Councilmember Wharton and I, the interesting thing is that district, the first map actually does disregard the highway as the barrier. It's a small toehold, but Council Member Wharton is very intentional with how he spends his time on the west side, and so he actually comes into Rose Park for me. So it's, it's interesting how the different districts have different perspectives on this, but the first map actually does disregard that, that artificial man-made barrier and gives Rose Park more of a, an amplified voice with two representatives. Guess what we? Yeah, and uh, you know, in the district, uh, the, the the map number one is the most similar uh, to our current boundaries. Um, and in my uh, in my suggestions to this map, it also is playing to the point of this. It's like adding another voice to you know this area of the west side that is, you know, it's sort of industrial, but it may it brings someone from another district. And then, you know, to the neighbors point uh, in, in the Guadalupe neighborhood that they love to have another voice because they feel like they can persuade another council member to do things and they arguably could have a majority almost of votes, uh, which is very clever. And, uh, and I think for some reason, you know, the, the, using the, the freeway as a boundary, it, it makes the freeway itself like a black hole. You know, where no one, you know, it being the boundary that no one wants to get close to it, so no one takes ownership, uh, you know, of the issues under the freeway, for example, and the underpasses. So I think shifting it is uh, obviously my preference. Obviously, you know, I'm spinning this to everybody, but um, I just, just wanted to share my thoughts on that. Do we have a copy of Councilmember Pui's map so we can see where it shifts or to? Or could, could you just kind of highlight your, uh, highlight it? Yeah, I can pull it up. Oh, okay. I would yeah. like to see that. Mr. Chair. Councilor Fowler. Um, but we still, even if I like your map, Ale, I, I think it is, if nothing else, somewhat symbolic as well. Um, and. I think that we need to take that into account. But even after that, we still need to make the decision on the precincts that are split, right? Yes. Okay. So this is the area where the District 5 boundary goes west over I-15. And something to note in these... Can you move that just to the uh, left to right of the division of the... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the four squares. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so most of these blocks are commercial, 
and some of them have no population. There is 53 residents in this one. Allegedly. <laughs> I've, I've driven through it and I cannot see the houses. It's just an in, it's a new development, uh, industrial. It's a tile, flooring and tile, whatever the place is. It's awesome, but I don't know where those 53 are, but they're <laughs> shifting uh, in my version. So these are the areas that would shift. Uh, the red lines, again, are the current council boundaries. And this does split one voting precinct, which is this area from 9th West up to 9th South. OK, may I ask you a question, Mr. Chair? So if. If you moved that further west, the 5th district further west to 9th west, but then moved the east part of it down to 15th east where we needed to not split that precinct, would, you, would we then have way too many people in District 5? So I'm going to shift the rest of this voting precinct to District 5. Yeah, okay. just for funsies. It's big. Is it is it largely populated? Yeah. So that would put District Five one thousand nine hundred and twelve, which is four hundred and eighty-five people more. So then, and almost three thousand more than District. Uh, yeah, District 2 would have 999 less than the ideal population. What about removing the things west of 13th, if that? Oh, but but I, I also want to, maybe I'm sorry to speak out of turn here, is the, are we, are we really making a, uh, over, over thinking the voting districts voting? Maybe I am. And, and I, I like your question. But I'm just now looking at it going, wow, there's 3,000 people difference. And I know one district, District 2, is going to probably maybe lose people, and District 5 is going to start gaining people. And if you're already up plus 2,000, it could be in the next 10 years. Is, this, worse. is this problem of splitting the voting precincts something new to our maps, or is this something that's been done before and is an inconvenience? It's it. Unfortunately, we're, there was a miscommunication in the beginning. Ideally, we would have had the um, maps, the, the, the group that looked at the maps, the, the commission, looking in terms of the voting districts as well as the census blocks. Um, but I, I understand that the county recorder has said she would wor you know, work with us on it, so. so. So go ahead, Ben. I don't know if we got. So I just want to reiterate the changes. Okay. So out to 9th West to capture the full voting precinct and adding that to District 5, and then shifting this voting precinct in its entirety to District 6. That brings District 6 to... 1,421 over, and District 5 to 453. Um, but it does all fit within the 5% um, parameters, 5% above or 5% below the ideal population. Can you show the, the, this map with the border um, between 2 and 4 and 3? Because I am wondering if this creates the same precinct problem up there. Yeah. So there's two precincts on the west side of downtown. It's. I mean, like right up, right up where you're. Uh, uh. Um, if you could like zoom in on the gateway, basically. Yep. And the gateway itself, right here. Uh -huh. is its own precinct. its own voting precinct and block because there's been so much density put in there. Okay, but the only problem with Alejandro's proposal with this one is that little corner thing, right? 
if we put that back in District 3, then there's no split precincts. So there, there's a lot along 8th South. What? In this proposed map, there are a lot of split precincts along 8th South. Yeah, and no, I just Correct. want to get the easy ones <laughs> done first. <laughs> Got um, it. So if we can put that triangle in my district, I'd pr I'm... This 99 percent sure that no one lives there yeah but it has population zero according okay. to the census well let's put it in district three just to keep it in the same precinct so that there's no precinct issue there and i don't think that there is this is a really weird part of the map you have to go even further like into it, it um, zoom in even further a little more do you see that other non like little notch thing? Okay, I just want to make sure that that is not splitting a precinct as well. I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure the precinct line. Okay, yeah. Now that you've highlighted it, the, this I, little bit. Yeah. So I have. I think I have that right now. Take that out. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it should be. Yes, that's how it should be. So no. Precinct but what about issue. that other little notch by the red line on the east side? So no one is reported as living okay. in here. That's already, that's not district, that's it, right? That's an office building, a hotel, and a parking lot. Okay, solve that one. Okay, um, so. Back to you, Darren. And <laughs> Ben, I'm sorry, can I, can Ben, you can, we need to get back to, uh, back to Amy's point and the question on the Wasatch Hollow. It was the two changes. The, the two changes. The voting and precinct west of I-15. Right. And then moving all of Wasatch Hollow into District 6. Right. And, and I look at this and say, oh, it's nice to move that far and, and not have to worry about the splitting of the voting precinct. But it ends up with uh, District 2 at minus 1,000, which is already a district that may not be increasing its population and we're going to start them off at, the, at, at a whole compared to uh, district six has got plus 1500 and that's that's a big i think even though it's probably within our variation that we gave the the, the group to it, i think it's uh far too much of a difference for me i mean one tiny home village gives us 500 there <laughs> So I, I think we have to acknowledge, like, I'm not worried about my district being down because I've got 692 I'm, units coming just in one project. But it, we do have to see where the if, planning and growth is happening right I'm now. Just, I'm, I'm pointing it out here. If, if you were up, if that's, mm -hmm. I will look at the district two and five and how they feel. I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and we actually had a community council uh, meeting the other day, and there's literally thousands of units being built in District 2. Um, but, you know, that is not really a thing that is part of the decision that's supposed to be made. You know, you, we're supposed to be basing it on the census. And while I like the idea of me, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, or not using the freeway, um, but if it splits the, the, the precinct, obviously it creates another problem. And that to me is a bit too much uh, of, you know, that is a bit too much. And I know there is a lot of people that are super engaged in the community and they're going to, you know, they're going to blame me now for this one. So I, um, so I, you know, I, I, now I'm a little uncomfortable with this. Uh, sorry, Darren, but, um, but I'm, I'm okay with the population being a little under, um, but a thousand may be too much. I mean, I would argue, I think, <laughs> sorry, okay. thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, when we talk about checking the number of boxes, I think having um, proportionate districts should be towards the top of the list, especially if we're, I mean, I think that having the, the symbolism, I think, is, is super important, and I, I'm not discounting that at all, but I would rank having us all have basically an equal vote in the number that we represent or as close to being equal as being more important for democracy's sake. Um, so if, if it creates this precinct problem, I would probably rather, okay. yeah, that's my opinion. Councilman Romano, did you have? Um, I just, I'm okay either way on, on that. I, I do 
feel like the the barrier whether it be just psychological or not of i-15 is significant and i i think that's regrettable but i don't want to make voting precinct issues and the population is really minimal uh if we go out to ninth west like you ha have there then it does make a population issue i think um ninth west also to me is a corridor that we should look at investing in as much as we have ninth south and um I don't know if that's something that we would be better if two council members sort of could advocate for Ninth West or if one could really own that issue. But I do see Ninth West as a huge, um, a huge opportunity on the west side. Um, so again, I don't know if we should, if council districts should or should not follow that, but I, I if this map were to be, um, adopted you better believe i'm going to start fighting even harder for ninth west than i had before so to that point i i would say um i mean i'm already going to fight for the west side i'm already going to fight for ninth west but this would give me even more reason to care about those issues just for the record that wasn't my map proposal so it's right. not like i prescripted that so i'm 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 uh hearing council member wharton basically going back to the idea that we kept what we had as a politely compact not really changing anything because the numbers are all there uh, we did have the proposal from council member Pui just to go to 800 west i think or no uh, 600 west uh, if we wanted to make it at least uh, symbolically to the west side of the freeway and not have the freeway as a boundary uh, we could we could stop there split the district uh or we can just leave it as what the politely um compact says without any changes at all except for chris's uh triangles. little triangles thank you <laughs> um how many precincts does it cut up the In, politely compact without any changes yeah so politely compact it's mostly 8th South again. But how many precincts so is that? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 on 8th South. And then it fixes two over in Wasatch Hollow that are currently split. So the, so the net change would be 5 with the gateway up here. It's technically split even though no one lives right. in that little purple um, part. Good. We can fix that one, make that part of D2. Um, so the total number of affected precincts is five. Net of five. Net of yes. five. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and make that yellow. <laughs> Always hated that office building. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have no strong feelings about that office building. <laughs> the Hyatt, however. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to, uh, Ben, for us, recap what we just did. So the council considered adding the voting precinct to 9th West to District 5 and fully moving Wasatch Hollow into District 6. It sounded like the population deviation was too large as a result of that pairing of moves. And so the council went back to the originally recommended minimal changes map and is only making one adjustment to the top of the precinct uh, where no one lives and keeping and the rest the of the recommendations. Is that, that includes that other little triangle bit, right? Well, yeah, that, that's, that's right here. Okay, okay. Yeah. There, so is there any way to to fix the precinct problem with on eighth south on eighth south or or reduce that number yeah so there are over two thousand people that live between eighth south and ninth south yeah from i-15 to i think it's ninth west it's it's this area so that is the strip that is proposed to be moved from District 4 into District 5. 
and it's it's a little over two thousand people. Okay, but if we just took like half and put them back in four, and you know, so you had it, you you didn't have an even line that went all the way down ninth. So you can do that for let's see. Or would that not make the numbers work? Because I well, think you get it's really. I don't know if it, yeah, it might not help because the problems are that five and four have plenty of people. Right, and and I look at this as you know, again, we're really kind of really yeah. the nat nat picking some mm -hmm. stuff where hey, we made a decision to move to eight south. Yeah. Yeah, we got a big population there, but. The decision and the reason for that move to 800 South uh, is uh, solid, mm -hmm. and the population change is solid. The difference is solid, uh, and I think the county can handle the, the, the split in the in the uh, voting districts precincts. It's only a few. It's not 100. It's five. Mr. Chair, how many precincts is it? I think it's five total. Five. Net. Net. It, are there any? Precincts are split between uh, two and uh, what is it, four or five? So two and five. There's no precinct split since yeah. it follows the freeway right now. And then this west downtown is split. Three ways. Three ways. And can, I, would you read me the numbers on population? Because I cannot see. I obviously need new eyes. For the whole the whole precinct. I guess I would like to. Uh, I, would, I cannot see what is the. DV, I'm uh, I'm uh, right now at District Two. Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm a little above, but, but barely. I'm by me. I mean District Two. Okay. Yeah. So the. The biggest difference is so District 5 would be the largest with 737 above the ideal, and District 7 would be the smallest with 663 less than the ideal. This is according to the proposed map. Correct. With no change, no. No changes, they'd affect population. Correct. And it was said to us that the county can handle it. They don't prefer not to, but they could. Cindy Liu spoke with um, uh, Director Swenson, and she said that they she would work with us. And I was just going to text her now and share. We'll give her the play-by-play. -play. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll confirm, as Cindy Gustafson mentioned, I've spoken with the recorder, Sherry Swenson. She's agreed. What if we put um, the one precinct where it splits into three, what if we, is there a way to make that one just down to two or down to one? What do you think? Yes, which, which ones would you like to change? I wouldn't. I, I just want, I want to know if it makes sense to like go through the exercise of doing it or not. I like, bet you there's a lot of people in both the, all those little... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I guess I just, I, from the county clerk, like when they say it's a problem, but we can work through it, like how big of a problem is it? Like if it's just annoying, then, Cindy, you know, Cindy. I'm sorry. Yeah. We, we don't know. This is the first time we've not followed them. So it was a surprise to me that we didn't follow them. Mm. It was uh, just an unfortunate miscommunication. So, mm. so we want to be respectful of their process, and they've been gracious with us. And so I'm just going to say, does five work for you? Yeah. Okay, great. With one being split three ways. Or maybe just leave that out. <laughs> Cindy Lou. No, I, I just wanted to say I'm happy to visit with Sherry uh, following this conversation if that would be helpful. Thank you. So this part of District, what would be part of District 2 is 253 people. So that would be easier to shift. Mm -hmm. 
this part of District 4 is 1,055 people. Ugh. And then District 5... This strip is 732 people. What if you move four and two down to ninth and it does like a little jaggedy? Oh. And then it's only split in between two people. Two. Uh, I'll just note that splitting through central ninth neighborhood like directly mm -hmm. which it is already the case so it's not so ninth and ninth is the four corners of salt lake city like <laughs> uh, no uh, creek is the four corners of utah and, and to your point uh there Emmanuel, that you will advocate for nine west nine west uh you know harder uh, if you took it i will advocate for the central ninth as well very you know very much so mm -hmm. What does that do? To so for, numbers? yeah, for the populations, um, yeah, District 5 is just five fewer than ideal. District 2 is 465 more than ideal, and District 4 is 679 more than ideal. Mm. So the biggest spread would be between District 4 and 7. Mm. I think we should go back. Sorry. Sorry I had you do that exercise. I think I, I did, so you can blame me this time, Chris. Okay, thanks. There's an undo button built in. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna wanna hit that twice. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if the council is, or the county is okay with it, we have five uh, split districts voting precincts and one split three ways. If that's good, how does this uh, council, this body feel about this uh, map. Can I just clarify? I'm counting seven split precincts. Am I counting wrong? Well, there's two. But we fixed two. Yeah, so in, the, in Wasatch Hollow, this red line is the current council boundary. But even along 8 South, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm looking at the wrong lines. I'm, am I not supposed to be looking at the green lines? Yeah, so the green lines are, are the voting precincts. And it, it's I still the, count seven. Right, so it's, it's a net f change of five because the two in Wasatch Hollow are taking two voting precincts that are currently split and putting them entirely into a I single council saying. district. So we still have seven. All total. along 8th South. We'll be, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, if we were gonna do a straw poll I mean, we ran. If we can, let's go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think there's another proposed change on the east side that was discussed, um, which was the area between 13th and 15th east and 13th and 17th south going to District 6. The area north of, um, not Foothill, what's this? Um, Parley's okay. Way below 21st south going also to six and then the area between 17th and 21st east and 17th and 21st south going to district seven is that this one no, no, uh the one west. west of that the yeah. triangle this triangle yeah right there. so that whole block group if you go by block group it actually that it works perfectly that whole block group going to six. And this, I think, was um, in an effort to keep neighborhoods, like existing neighborhoods in the same district, um, as was proposed by the community council letter that we all received. Because um, I think Councilmember Dugan was saying that triangle feels more like related to his District 6 and then move the neighborhood. District, 
move the district up there at 17, 17 east to 21st east. So there's two blocks. And there's 1,500 people in that triangle. And then move the one above the 17th east to 19th east. The uh, far west. Book. Actually, 17th to 21st. Yeah, yeah. So that's two block groups. Nope. Make it smaller. Do not. I don't necessarily want this. It's just something yeah. that was discussed. So go to 17th East, Ben. Go to 17th East, Ben, and, and 17th South or 21st South. That block right there. That went to District 7 all the way to 21st East. Just this one? Yeah, yep. And one more, actually. One more. Sorry. So is it all of? Yep. All of this one? Yep. Uh, the one next to it? Yeah, yep, and the one next to it. No, actually, all four of those. Two more east. And then this mm -hmm. bit as well. And this would be going to seven, seven. to District Seven. Oh, but the other uh, the other uh, triangles should be going to District Six. So the, the block. this highlighted area is just over 2,400 people. Oh, yeah. but, then if, but then if you take that triangle out, then because that, that triangle's. Yeah, so if I make this change to District 7, and then this triangle of 1,500 people, so that's a net change of 900. But it's also the change of Wasatch Hollow to District 6 as well. Yes, it still, it still includes that change up here, these two. So that, no, that hasn't I think the proposal was everything east of 13th to go to District 6. Yeah, and then move that, that uh, Wasatch Hollow, Every, that, that everything whole thing. East of 1300 to go uh, nor north of 17th. North of 17th. That block right there. So this one would also right. go to District 6. Right. And this is f a little over 1,400 people. That's pretty, well, that's pretty good. And then there's room to so the, go west of the freeway <laughs> with five. <laughs> with those changes, the, the biggest difference is District 5 is 722 mm -hmm. below ideal, and District 6 is 467 above. So below that, because I think uh, there might be a little uncertainty exactly what we just did. So what was transferred was this western half of Wasatch Hollow, which went from District 5 to District 6. And then these three from 17th East over to 2100 East, between 17th South and 2100 South were transferred from District 6 into District 7. Right. And then this triangle from 2100 South down to the city limit along Foothill and Parley's was transferred from District 7 into District 6. Right. So, so three changes. Right. So could you uh, zoom out a little bit more and then it would give uh, Councilmember Fowler a little bit better view? And I'll turn on the current boundaries right. so okay. you can see the change in Wasatch Hollow the change in the northeast corner of Sugar House and this triangle. And where this that was to right achieve. Now? That triangle is north of Parley's. That's where the water is. It's currently in six. It's currently in seven. Oh, it's currently in seven. Yeah. I think the 
the proposal was to achieve keeping community councils and sort of identi neighborhood identities within the same council district as proposed by that letter from the community council chairs that we all received. But I don't know. Do you, ben, do you remember roughly what the totals were before we made these changes in terms of district variation from the number? That, from the um, number? Let me hit my friendly <laughs> undo button. Thank you. <laughs> and we can see. So districts five, six, and seven. District five is up 737. District six is down just over 100. And district seven is down 663. And then if I redo those, So after redoing those, District 5 went from being 700 above to 700 below. District 6 went from being 100 to being 600 above. And District 7 went from being 600 below to being 225 above. Okay. I'm having like the reading rainbow gif with all of the math equations like <laughs> happening but which of those two thing uh, of those is the mathematically better i i, I don't know I, I, you, you add them all together divide by three cosine yeah does Inverse. someone have a graphing calculator I bet the parks department is real <laughs> sad about their choice to ask us to I wait. I think it, uh, we could be getting far too into the minutiae on this side. I think, and that could be. may be the confusion right now. <laughs> because we have a map and we have a person who can kind of manipulate the map, we might be going into the, uh, the uh, rabbit hole very far. So the, the proposal right now is just this thing here, the triangle of uh, District 3 up where the one office building is, and um, stopping at that point, leaving leaving the western boundary the same as it is right now. Okay, the only reason I'm asking, Mr. Chair, I just don't wanna be contradicting what I previously said, which is that I think that it's more important to have districts that are closer to the ideal number than it is to... Um, yeah. Yeah. And so. I think these aren't far over the okay. other ideal numbers. Great. I just don't have the math skills to be able to know. So I'm relying, I'm putting this out to the universe. Anybody that does, in, thank you. Zoom into the chart on the left side because that will help. Look, 8, 20,000, 20, Okay, I did the math. It goes from an average deviation of 493 to an average deviation of 479. So it's mathematically almost the same. It's an improvement though, right? But it's an improvement. <laughs> oh, that, that is satisfying. Thank and for you. an attorney, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think this is all I can handle for the day. So <laughs> I will, this, so this I will, will look be my for last a, comment. I'll look for a straw poll on what we have up here at this time. Mr. Chair, I would propose that um, we do a straw poll and tentatively adopt this proposed map as shown on the screen. May I have a qu clarification? It was, is the little square uh, that Chris Warren said that he hates uh, in District 2? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, you'll get the office building that I... I support them. <laughs> yes. So is that a second or is that just a... Oh, okay. Everyone give a thumbs up who is it in approval of Chris's straw poll. You have uh, seven thumbs up Kay. for this uh, proposal. Politely compact CW, Chris Wharton. Yes. Chris Wharton changes. <laughs> and that includes 
the, the three changes to the eastern boundaries, the Wasatch Hollow, the Northeast Sugar House, and the Triangle. Okay. Uh, we will get a copy of the map out to the council and get a copy uh, added uh, for the public to take a look at, and then the vote is scheduled for next Tuesday. Wow, Ben, thank you very much. Council? Mr. Chair, just reading the comments on uh, Councilmember Valdemar has mentioned this, the comments from the community, uh, from the mailers. There's a lot of people that couldn't discern the map because they didn't have streets. So I wonder if, we, if there is a way to share this map with major streets more clear for the community because there was a lot of questions about this. Lots of people were sending us comments, some of them kind of angry comments about what we were doing. So I may be clarifying again that we do this in the, every 10 years and try to give them a, a quick rundown through this week. I think that would be very useful. And of course, this doesn't apply to people that maybe have digital access issues, but, if, but they can click on the link and it's much easier to zoom in. So if anyone in the public has a problem looking at the PDFs and does have access to the internet, those links are much easier to, to zoom in on. Yeah, but looking in District Builder, you get more information. Thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you, Council, for uh, that uh, robust discussion on that issue. And it's, it's, you know, we were kind of joking around there, but it's, it's important and, and it's, uh, uh, it's our business and it's our district, so I appreciate all the discussion we're going. We're moving on to item number four, back to item number four, the information of the Glendale Regional Park Master Plan update. We have Kristen Riker here, Allison is on the screen, Nancy and Catherine Moss, welcome. And we, we just have a hard stop at 435. Okay, could do that. Thanks. If I had my clapper board, I'd take two. <laughs> <laughs> yes, take two, exactly. <laughs> the floor's yours. Hi, Thank you, Council. Um, thanks for allowing us to present this afternoon. We're really excited to um, share progress on the design and planning for the Glendale Regional Park and the framework for um, the site master plan that we have. Um, the project, project started last fall with an analysis and community engagement, community and stakeholder engagement, um, and will be ongoing through the summer as we finalize the preferred plan and the master plan document. Um, I'm Kristen Riker. I'm the Director of Public Lands. At the table with me is Kat Moss, our Public Lands Planner, and Nancy Monteith, Senior Landscape Architect and, uh, with the Engineering Division. Our consultant team is led um, by Design Workshop. Re they were responsible for landscape architecture and planning on the project. They were supported by David Evans and Associates, Public Engagement Specialists, Agora Partners, which is a, cons um, a firm that consults in park development, activation and management, and river restoration. They are experts in ecolog ecological restoration. Uh, next slide, please. So the Glendale Water Park site, also referred to as Raging Waters, <clears throat> has been closed since 2018. The water park is 17 acres bordering the Jordan River, and it is protected under strict regulations of the federal land and water conservation funding, so LWCF. It is protected because 30 years ago, the water park, when the water park was built, the city applied for and received a federal grant funding um, the development of the site with the LWCF funds. When the park was determined to be no longer viable, Salt Lake City gained approval from the Utah State Department of Natural Resources, <coughs> excuse me, to demolish the water park um, and to start the rebuild. So with that demo and the approval from the Natural Resources Department, um, a three-year time frame began in which the city is required to reopen the site or at least a portion of the site to outdoor recreation. And we'll get into that a little bit more, the, um, Nancy and Kat will. Um, right now, our current state is that demolition is underway and we will continue throughout the spring. 
Uh, late last year, we hired a consultant to work with the community to develop a plan to repurpose the site into a regional park. The vision plan that is underway will guide future development improvements and redevelopment of the site, incorporate programming and operations and maintenance needs, and will reflect first and foremost the desires of the Glendale neighborhood while also making this a place that everyone in our city can enjoy by incorporating regional amenities. With the past and the future uses of the park, the vision plan will become the community guided master plan and will go through the formal master planning process. So with that, I'll turn it to Nancy and we'll go to the next slide. Thanks, so what we have here is the scope of work for the consultant and it includes research of precedent plans or parks uh, assessing the existing conditions, uh, pursuing opportunities for programming and conducting research on operation, operations and management, as well as an assessment of the current sort of neighborhood and regional demographics that might influence the programming and the use of the site. And then um, the development of alternatives, robust public engagement, and ultimately the creation of that master plan. So that, that work's been happening over the last eight months, and we just recently completed the alternatives development to share with the public. We had Next slide. A, we had a, um, uh, two, two, two plans that were developed, and we shared that at a public open house, and then also a public survey where we received several thousand responses to that. And the team is now evaluating that input to create the preferred plan in order to share that out with the public in May, in early June, and then we'll finalize that master plan. Um, that's after our schedule here for you, and we'll come back in late summer, early fall to present that final master plan. Next slide. Um, so the the most uh, overarching precedent plan is the Reimagine Nature, which you've heard a lot about. Um, it is a great starting point for a project like this. We looked at equity, stewardship, and environment. So looking at that, we had a foundation about how to approach the project. We have incorporated an ecological focus and restoration of the riparian corridor. The park character will be rooted in the diversity and character of the Glendale community through the desired amenities, the development of the look and the feel of the park, and incorporation of artistic elements. Reimagine Nature also calls for park activation through programming and events, and our consultant team has been reaching out to community partners and organizations that would be interested in activating the site. The plan also provides a system level view of the park and to create stronger connections that can be made between the adjacent public land sites to enhance the network and provide more service to the community. The other plan that's the most germane for what we're talking about today is the Salt Lake County Master Plan and that was uh, completed in 2015 and the two most uh, relevant items out of that plan is that plan called for a new class one regional park in Salt Lake City west of I-15 and that should include sports field, trails, a water playground, swimming pool, passive recreation. So it actually aligns really well with what the community is telling us. Currently, Salt Lake County operates all of Salt Lake City aquatics and ice facilities, as well as the city's recreation sports programs, and we are in conversations with the county now talking about um, potential partnerships and hoping to realize some of these high priority uh, amenities. Next slide, and uh, I'll turn it over to Kat. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the site a little bit. So um, the Glendale Regional Park site is very opportunely situated along the Jordan River, um, and it's connected to many other open spaces as well. It's adjacent to the Glendale Neighborhood Park, the Glendale Golf Course, and it's across the street from the 17 South River Park. And contiguously, this kind of swath of connected over open space along the Jordan River is nearly 150 acres, which is about the same size as Liberty Park. and. As we're doing public engagement, a lot of folks on the west side have reported that they travel east for their park experiences, and we're really hoping to create connections between these open spaces to deliver a unique experience for west side residents and meet them where they're at there. And we're also specifically working with transportation to improve the safety and access across 1700 South, which we found through public engagement as well is like a um, very high community priority. Next slide, please. 
And as uh, Nancy and Kristen kind of mentioned, um, in looking at this future site, the success of this park will also be really dependent on the programming that we'll be able to achieve. So we have a sub-consultant on board, Agora Partners, um, who is working with Design Workshop to determine the future needs of the park, including maintenance and staffing based on the type of amenities that we'll see on the site, um, identifying interested programming partners to help activate the site, and looking at other parks throughout the nation to kind of determine what's already been done in the past and help us identify potential challenges that we might face in programming the site. Um, and based on early engagement with stakeholders and interest groups, um, environmental programming, art and dance groups, um, food vendors and food trucks and aquatics have really risen to the top of the list in terms of both interested parties in partnering with the city for programming and what the public would like to see in that space on the site. Next slide, please. And then as, as part of this process, we've conducted a demographic study of the potential user groups for the site. And our primary market area, which is the Glendale neighborhood here on the left that you can see, um, is where we kind of expect about 60 to 80% of our users to be drawn from and who we expect to use this park on a weekly basis. Um, the secondary market is on the right here, and that's the entirety of Salt Lake City. We kind of expect these folks to treat the park as a destination, traveling here for specific amenity or activity that this park has to offer. And then in our analysis, we specifically looked at household size, age, race and ethnicity, and income level. And the in information that we collected showed that this primary market area, um, Glendale, in comparison to the city and even more so the county, that the average household size is larger, the median age is younger, the racial and ethnic diversity is significantly greater, and the median household income is lower. And so each of these tidbits of information and findings have really serious implications for the future uses and programming at the site. Um, and so this information kind of really highlights the need for low cost and free programs and activities, amenities for a wide variety of age, ra age ranges, ranges with a focus on um, families and youth in particular, and finally opportunities for accessing the natural environment while also, also incorporating elements of placemaking that really highlight the unique character of this um, primary market area, the Glendale neighborhood. And next slide, please. Um, so in order to kind of celebrate the Glendale community with this plan, which is one of our primary goals, the project team prioritized neighborhood and stakeholder engagement really early on in the process to ensure that the community voice was really what guided the, um, establishing the vision for this plan. So we started with the Glendale Community Council, community leaders and stakeholders, and then also with um, youth engagement with the Glendale Middle School and Mountain View Elementary School students. Um, the project team met multiple times with the students on site and in their classroom. We engaged in design charrettes and ultimately um, used the direction that we received from about 130 students to guide the plan alternatives that you'll see here in a moment. Um, and we also attended a number of event events with the Glendale community, and we created a community advisory committee um, to really ensure that neighborhood represented representation was at the forefront of the plan creation. And so we targeted specific members to invite to participate on our advisory committee, and these members really represented a diversity of organizations and community groups throughout Glendale and provided really key information early on on our mission, our goals, engagement, and the vision for the future of this park, which will le uh, led to the development of these two site plans that you'll see in just a minute. Next slide, please. And then just to touch really briefly, um, and one element of this first window of engagement involved developing and confirming the mission and goals for this plan. Um, and that's really for this Glendale Regional Park to be an iconic neighborhood park that celebrates the community, but also kind of creating a regional draw um, and to improve access to nature and activities and in turn, it really improving the environmental quality for West Side residents. And we divided the goals into two groups, goals to serve the community and goals to address the environmental needs and health of the site. And we wanted to really ensure that this plan was community-led and highlight this, um, the unique access to nature that this space could provide. Next slide, I'll turn it back to Nancy. So now we'll share the two plans. So the, the, so the consultant developed two uh, different positions or approaches to developing the site, more to create a contrast and something to, um, for the people to uh, have a reaction to. So, they were based on the ideas that came out of the youth and community engagement and the community advisory committee. 
you know, what the purpose is, is to relay a range of amenity ideas and two distinctly different characters. And this first one is the great outdoors, and it's about nature in your backyard. It highlights the connection to nature, featuring natural spaces on the Jordan River, celebrating nature through education and play, while also emphasizing a sense of adventure through the chosen amenities. The plan included a community garden, nature play, trails, shade, meadow and lawns, and features along the Jordan River, including a boardwalk and a boat launch. The next, uh, next slide, the Glendale Green site plan is a, um, much different in the look and the layout to kind of test is there a formal or informal desire for the community in terms of how it's formed. And this one, the Glendale Green, is the hub of the community. And this plan really focuses on the community and the connections. It proposes features, configuration, and elements that highlight gathering spaces, vibrant play, and opportunities for socializing and engaging with neighbors. Amenities that could be included might be a food truck court, pavilions, colorful playgrounds, and active programming like skating, climbing, and swimming. We asked the public to view these plans more as a puzzle. We weren't asking to pick or choose which plan was preferred, but more think about which amenities do you see yourself using, what would draw you to the site, and where do you like certain things being located. As the public weighed in, the project team has been able to see which pieces of this puzzle are most desirable for the community and where things should be located and priorities for inclusion in phase one. The project team is now developing the final preferred plan that contains the elements combined from both of these two alternatives. So in weighing in with these two, um, next slide. Oh. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> in weighing in with these two com um, site plans, we gathered community input through a survey that we kicked off through an open house um, at the Community Learning Center in Glendale. So residents of Glendale, members of our community advisory committee, and um, residents of the city at large kind of attended to orient themselves to these plans in person and get involved with the project. Um, and then the public survey was open for one month, and we garnered over 1,360 responses, um, and that closed April 16th. And when we closed that, we met a third time with our community advisory committee to kind of debrief what we'd learned, and now we're moving forward with the final preferred concept. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a really quick snapshot of the recent public engagement, concluding with the survey. Um, including how we gathered our input, who we received responses from, and what some of the preferences for this plan were. And overall, we had really positive reactions to the mission and the goals and values. And already, um, before we kicked off this window, but confirmed by the survey and the event, um, a few key amenities and features began to really rise to the top for inclusion in the final plan. Um, next slide, please. And a, a few of those are on the screen here. Um, through the community advisory committee meetings, the survey responses and events, it's really clear that an outdoor swimming pool is highly desired by this community at this location and that the community is really lacking a water feature for play. Um, the hill where the slides used to convene seemed to be a really popular site for potential hiking trails, biking trails, and a viewpoint. And many people expressed uh, a desire to access the Jordan River from this site. And then finally, a community gathering space with um, multiple food options, active recreation opportunities like sport court and skating features also ranked really highly. Next slide, please. Um, and then along with these specific amenities, rising to the top, we begin to see some themes kind of emerge as well that tie all these features together, um, including the need for a really safe gathering and event space um, was really important to the community, active features for all ages with accessible design and assistive technologies, and then bright and playful feel and features that like really capture the unique character of the site and of the community. Next slide, please. So how do we bring it all together? So this, uh, this plan really shows an analysis diagram. On the right are all the top features with the most popular in green and the sort of the next popular in red. And then we've um, gave them a spatial dimension to it and located them on the site plan. And that is really to start looking for adjacencies and synergies that could happen. So these preferred amenities, um, this is analysis uh, to look at where phase one might occur and what really needs to go together. 
And due to the tight timeline that we've talked about, public lands needs to move forward with phase one improvements before the master plan is adopted. And aspects that will inform phase one features of the development is, um, you know, the cost of the amenities. Can we implement it with the funding that we have available right now, which is 3.2 million? Location, is it located near other phase one amenities or are they support features for that site use? And then the feasibility, what's the complexity and what other things need to be in place to be successful with that amenity? So the list that we've um, we're working with right now are the development of the play feature. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this, we're a good team. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the development of the play features, the community gathering space, parking, and associated amenities. Um, they represent essential components to almost any park and will immediately foster community activation. The play features, the gathering spaces, walking paths, are um, some of the higher priority features, but there are others like the swimming pool or the water play rank much higher, but it would be very difficult to implement them with the funding that we have in the timeline that we have. Um, we will construct as much as we can in this phase. We're hoping if funding allows that include, also include amenities around the river. Um, and then if we receive other funding in the meantime, we can um, increase that phase one and certainly stagger that so that we can deliver as much as soon as possible. I did want to share with you, so, so we will be issuing an RFQ for design imminently, <laughs> hopefully next week, and that is for that phase one. And the reason we have to do that is when you think about the next steps, it takes typically about two months to hire a consultant and then seven to nine months for improvement, to design improvements that are around $3 million to go through the review, permitting, things like that. And then bidding typically takes two months to get a contractor on board. And then construction's about 12 months. And what you see here, we are then at April 2024. <laughs> so, we, so we really tried to figure out what are those amenities that we are sure will be included in the final master plan? What are the things that we would want regardless? And what can we achieve? And what will help activate that site imme immediately? Um, one of the things that we'll do, you'll see that they're still fairly general. When we get that consultant on board um, in June or July, when we start out, we will circle back with the community advisory committee and um, the local schools to test sort of some of the options, the ideas, and the look and feel of these things as we move forward. So the next slide. So then I'll just... Um, blaze through this really quick <laughs> awesome things um, and let you know that we'll be tying these missions and goals to the final uh, master plan that you will see um, but in order to keep this master plan in line with the community values we have already vetted the mission and the goals with the public um, which showed like I mentioned overall very positive reactions from the community so these goals and mission will come back to you in the final master plan planning document and we'll kind of structure the plan in the meantime with these in mind knowing that they are supported by the community. Uh, next slide. So next steps, um, the design team is now working towards a final uh, site concept plan that will be based on the community input we've gathered so far. The concept plan is created, um, that is created, will be shared with the community advisory committee and others to confirm that the design is reflective of the community desires and needs. Once this concept is confirmed, the team will work towards a final master planning document that will go through the formal adoption process with the planning commission, the mayor, and the city council. So at this, um, at the same time while we're doing that, uh, the planning team will assess the priorities determined through the public engagement along with the feasibility of implementation and determine construction scope of work for phase one implementation to be open to the public by 2024. And the full build out of Glendale Park Master Plan will likely be completed in phases as funding comes available. Last slide. So that is our presentation and we're happy to take questions and um, comments. Thank you very much. Oh, oh go ahead, Councilman Fowler. 
I was just, I think that uh, Council Member Wharton and Mayor Mendenhall are the only ones besides staff that remember this, but do I finally get a friendship swing? <laughs> friendship swing? <laughs> As long as the community wants it. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Petro. Um, so you've got the young constituent approval. He wants to know if he can reserve a pavilion for his 13th birthday party. Oh, <laughs> <He's> nice. <laughs> is that April 2024? It, it is. Oh, that's perfect timing. <laughs> um, I see that on the phase one features with the, with the colored circles, I see that there's two red circles. One says all ages playground and one says adaptive playground. Is that just to identify that we have two separate strategies? Do we have a universal design guiding principle that we would be employing here? Yes, we, we will be following this notion about assistive design and our accessible design in all of it. And that's sort of ha make the entire park accessible to anyone at, with all abilities. I think this, the, this is really a study showing all the list of options. I think we'll see more evolution, but we, it shows how would it get distributed on the site. There's a lot more work. I don't know if we'll have one large play area with multiple features or if there might be distributed. I think it's a little. I'm early a huge to advocate tell. for universal design and making sure yeah. that you know all kids can play together in the yeah. same space. Thank you. Councilman Pui. Yeah, so I have a few questions. The was the consult consultant uh, given in a, a budget to come up with these designs uh, or and like a final build out? Budget? I mean, yeah, yeah. I just uh, trying to figure out where how I'm, I'm trying to square away amounts here uh, in my mind because I, it's not too long that we were talking about Pioneer Park. Um, sure. And uh, I believe it was over $10 million that we wanted to, that, you know, the city was requesting to that park. And I, you know, I don't understand how a regional park will cost, you know, this less money than adding a few amazing features to the Pioneer Park. So I'm trying to compare. Do you mind if I, or yeah, go ahead. Well, I think, I don't know, we have currently 3.2 million, but we recognize that will not develop the full entire site. I think we were looking to, we we're hoping to receive more funding. Um, you know, I, the, we did not give like a, a distinct number, but I think, there is always this desire to kind of balance between what's achievable and what's reasonable. And um, certainly with Pioneer Park, and the consultant is very aware of sort of typical or precedent or, or consistent park development costs across the country. So they, they would sort of fit within that. And I think really the idea was what, what does the community want and the West Side deserves significant amount of investment so they're working on those final numbers oh. i think something to keep in mind is that over the last couple years the volatility of the construction market has uh kind of exploded all our minds about what things <laughs> cost <laughs> and so I, th I think well you know we have to be open but also flexible as we move forward sure. i don't know if Kristen wants to no, add to that. No, you answered well. So I guess the, the follow-up to that is I would love to see what will it take to yes. come up with some of those site plans and, and what 3.2 million will buy. You know, what, what can the community see from that? Because, the, you know, the timeline is tight, uh, right? So by April 2024, something will have to be open. That's right. So, I, you know, just setting the expectations right is important to me because, you know, these this site plans are amazing and I would just love to see any of them, but that might not be what we see in April 2024, right? Because money, I don't know, but I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that's what we see, but... Well, you will not see the whole plan right. in 2024. Right. We couldn't even, if it was entirely funded, we couldn't deliver the whole thing in 2024. Yeah, so but, uh, it, it, you know, the, 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 the list of improvements that we provided, we believe at this time, a play feature, a community gathering, walking paths, supportive amenities, that we can do that. But again, you know, it, it's like, what is that play? How big is it? So some of the, so it's, 
testing that as we move forward. And it, it hasn't been designed yet, and so once it's designed, we'll have cost estimates, and then we can um, provide that to you in a briefing if you're if that's what you're requesting. So, yeah. uh, and I appreciate that. That will be very helpful. And this reminds me of something that is happening. There's a lot of issues with Georgia, with the Peace Gardens right now, oh. and uh, I, you know, I'm just throwing this into the air about you know that. It would be amazing to have a, a, a regional park, and I want this to happen. But I also, we have some parks right now that they're being vandalized and destroyed, and I, I don't know what we need to do. But I will like some suggestions about what we can do. And, and I, right, and that's where the emphasis on programming and activation is so important for this site. And um, we our consult is highly aware in helping us develop those. And, and that's what the community is asking for as well. Councilmember Fowler. Mr. Chair. Oh, hold on a second, Allison. Councilmember Fowler. Yeah, I think to um, Alejandro's point, and it's something that um, Kristen, who's been working with me since I've been on the council, is um, the, the managing expectations of our residents, right? And like not not promising a unicorn and, and then like being like, just kidding, there is no unicorn. Um, and so I, I think that is incredibly important. And then of course, as you know, and I know that when it comes back to the council, there will be this piece of maintenance and how we're funding ongoing maintenance for it. So just um, those are always the two things that I <laughs> emphasize and bring up all the time. Um, with projects like this. Second Mr. That. Chair, can I, yeah. I, two things. Tune in for the budget tonight. You might really like what you hear. There's more we're asking for, like a lot more. And second, there's also ongoing support for just that in the budget. So these wonderful People are being very polite, but I, I didn't want this conversation to start to balloon um, beyond something that is just hours away. So both maintenance and a significant amount more money for that, for this park, for the Glendale Park, um, both coming in the budget proposal and there's one other piece, park rangers. Also, let's like this isn't the time for that necessarily, but our 16 park rangers are hired. They're in training right now. They're going to be on the Jordan River Parkway, as you know, and I think that they're we're all hopeful that they will have flexibility to kind of move into the some of the parks um, on occasion that aren't on the list that we will definitely have a presence in. So there's a lot going on to address some of the general park needs. But thank you for being tight-lipped about the budget, but I just had to stick it in there. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, for the, uh, the teaser there for the budget. <laughs> Allison, did you, Allison, did you have something? And the mayor took the words right out of my mouth, thanks. <laughs> Council, any other questions, comments? Uh, I appreciate the, the work on this. I'm excited about it. And I'm also excited about how you talked about uh, getting across that big, uh, Mississippi River called 17 South from one part of the green space to the other. So that is a big deal because that just makes that park even, I mean, that's Central Park plus. So I think that's exciting uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, more to come. Thanks a lot. So much. Thank you all. Okay, Council, we're taking a uh, short 15 minute break, 20 minutes breaks, 30 minute break. We're Clock 1700 for all those uh, who go by 24 hour clock.
take that uh, little recess there. Appreciate that very much. We're going to uh, start back up with our uh, item number five on our agenda, which is the uh, parameters of resolutions, the Public Utilities Revenue Bond Series 2022. And we have on the uh, on the tile, we have Laura Briefer. Thank you very much, Laura, for uh, joining us this afternoon. We have uh, Sam. Oh, I didn't. I didn't uh, remind Sam. He's on. Okay. I'm here, Mr. Chair. Pardon me. I'm here. Pardon okay. me. Okay. Wonderful, Sam. It's all. It's all yours. And we also have uh, Lisa Tarafelli from the Finance Administrator. Sam, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Department of Public Utilities is here in front of the council. Um, in, clo in close proximity to their FY23 budget presentation, however, the bond proposal in front of you now is technically part of the fiscal year 22 uh, revenue budget. So a couple of the highlights for the 22 bond series that's being proposed. The bond funds would generate revenue for projects in the water and wastewater utilities, uh, respectively 298 million uh, for the wastewater reclamation facility project happening now, and about $51 million for various capital projects in the water utility. The amortization schedule of the debt is about 30 years. Uh, peaking substantially between now and 2037 and then plateauing and tapering off a bit from 2037 to 2052 with that. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd ask to turn it over to the department for council member questions and additional details. Thank you. Thank you, Sam and Laura, it's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Council Chair Dugan and Sam. Um, good to see everybody. Um, I wanted to just follow up a little bit to what Sam had presented um, and just um, mentioned that Lisa Tarfelli, our finance administrator, is here. And we also have had some really wonderful support from um, the city's financial advisors at Stiefel, Nicholas & Company, particularly John Crandall and Elizabeth Reed, and um, the city's bond council um, with Gilmore and & Bell, and that's Brad Patterson. Um, also wanted to thank uh, our city recorder, Cindy Lou Trishman, for her assistance on this effort, too. Um, as was mentioned, we are looking to um, move forward on more favorable market conditions and um, move up some planned bonding that we had planned to do in fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 22. Um, again, that's that's just to capture favorable market conditions and um, was already something we were planning to do in fiscal year 23. Uh, council might notice that budget amendment number seven um, includes the change in revenue that this uh, 2022 series bond would reflect. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other things I just wanted to quickly mention, as we've been conveying through not only this fiscal year 23 budget process, but previous, budget processes with the administration and council. Um, we have some very significant uh, aging water infrastructure needs and regulatory compliance needs that we are trying to be proactive in implementing. And that includes some pretty high value projects like the repair and replacement of water treatment plants and major water lines. Um, so this 2022 series bond uh, a large portion of that will go to the continuing construction of the new water reclamation facility, which it, the impetus for that was to uh, meet new regulatory requirements for nutrients and also to replace aging infrastructure. And then um, the remainder, about 68 million to the water utility, and that is really to focus on treatment plants and, and water lines primarily. Uh, Sam did a great job on his staff report, and he included some information about a financial capability assessment that the department is also uh, undergoing. We've completed phase one. Uh, financial capability assessment is something that is um, found under the Federal Clean Water Act, and it's intended for uh, utilities that have to comply with substantial 
Clean Water Act regulatory obligations um, as part of running a sewer utility or a stormwater utility. And it was uh, placed into the Clean Water Act because a lot of these obligations can be quite costly and there is a need to understand whether the high cost of compliance um, presents a financial burden to a community. And so there are formulas in place to conduct a financial capability assessment, basically currently uh, based on a community's uh, median household income. Uh, the city for a few reasons, public utilities for a few reasons, wanted to go a little deeper than the Clean Water Act um, guidelines. And we worked through some additional recommendations from the National Academy of Public Administrators to take a deeper dive in financial capability, um, both with water and sewer um, infrastructure needs. And so phase one, that there's a fact sheet um, in the staff report and in our FY23 budget on the results of our phase one financial capability study, which indicates that the community does have the capability to um, absorb this additional debt. We are going to do additional phases of financial capability as we move along to inform us over the next several years and look at other details like um, environmental justice and uh, other demographic details. And we're also currently reviewing new guidance that EPA has submitted for public comment on assessing financial capability for uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. And I think that's all I have. At least, is there anything that I missed that you would like to add um, to this briefing? Um, so Laura, I think that you've covered everything very well, just that um, in uh, the council uh, briefing document, uh, Sam did include uh, that longer term debt modeling so it wasn't some of these numbers are taking into account what we're doing right now, but also that longer look. And then the other thing I wanted to do is mention that Boyd is on the call and he is uh, uh, one of our key players at the city in in bonding. And he is always just so gracious and helpful. And, and he's here if there's any questions on the resolution itself. I'll add one one more thing I forgot to mention is um, as part of your consideration for adopting the bond parameters resolution uh, tonight. Um, there's also a consideration to set a public hearing for May 17th as well. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, any questions from the council? Councilman Romano. Uh, just, I, I understand that there's a, this is a multi-step process. Can we just explain for my benefit, but also the public's, what we're adopting tonight and what the other steps of the process? I know you said there'll be a public hearing, but we're just adopting the parameters and then we'll actually adopt the resolution which would allow public utilities to issue the bond later or when. How does that exactly all work? Let me jump in. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Boyd. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm Boyd Ferguson from the city attorney's office. Um, what council member Mono describes is how it used to be, but the state legislature amended the bonding statute to allow the parameters resolution to identify the maximum principal amount, the maximum maturity, the max, maximum interest rate, some other things, but also to designate certain city officers, normally the mayor and the council chair, to accept the purchase from the uh, bond buyer and any terms of the bonds within those maximums that I described so that this doesn't have to come back to the council again. So this will be the only resolution adopted by the council and then it sets the hearing and then after that stuff happens as we get to the closing, but then it just closes without having to bother the council again. Thank you, Boyd. Any other further questions or comments? Councilmember Fowler. I just um, wanted to say thanks to the team for waiting for us. And I know that you were here waiting and then luckily we are on this hybrid, but um, it was very important for all of us to go up today. And so thanks so much for kind of being patient with us as we sort of just 
abandoned ship for a minute, but um, to so show our solidarity and support. So thanks, Laura and Lisa and team for rearranging your schedules. <laughs> You know, well, thank see. you. I, I think Laura must be having a connectivity issue. It looks like she has a yellow triangle on her oh. box right now. But yes, uh, we appreciate the council's consideration and, you know, un understand that schedules have to be fluid. Well, thank you very much to Lisa. Uh, Laura, if you can still hear me and uh, Boyd, uh, we, council will now move on to item number. Oh. I'm going to uh, go to item number nine and I'll come back to eight, but we go to item number nine, which is the amending the Salt Lake City Code pertaining to the use of the city owned motor vehicle follow up. I have Ben should be coming up here. I have uh, Chief Brown, I have Rachel, Sarah Montoya, uh, she might be on the screen, and I have also uh, Jorge is here too, if we have any questions. Council Chair, um, we do have some slides that Chief Brown will go through. Um, before we get there, though, I wanted to just give a quick overview, and then I'll hand it over to Chief Brown. Um, so, this we, the mayor's office began looking at this policy over the last year or so, when other cities, when our city and other cities nationwide began facing really pretty serious difficulties recruiting and retaining police officers. So, numerous officers had. Oh, I'm sorry. Is yeah, we, sorry. Sorry, I'm got that was my mistake. Got sorry, ahead Rachel. Of ben. I'm sorry, Ben. Ben, we're going to have you give the introduction for the presentation. Uh, I was going to turn the time over to the administration. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect blend. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> That's the way you do it. Thanks for covering yeah. for my <laughs> my, my mistake there. <laughs> um, thank you. So. Again, we started looking at this policy as we were facing, which was not unique to our city, um, pretty serious issues recruiting and retaining police officers. Numerous officers had approached our office, and I know at least some of the council members, regarding the disparate impact that our current ordinance had on certain members, or has on certain members of the department. And they brought up some really important policy considerations. The main concern was that the 35 mile limit that you see in the ordinance today felt arbitrary for the way that the city has grown. And as housing gets more and more expensive along the Wasatch Front and we're recruiting officers from across the Wasatch Front, not really just in Salt Lake County or even our neighboring counties, um, we are dealing with officers who, ha who live further away, who have to live further away, or you know, who, have ch who wanna work in Salt Lake City but you know, do live farther away, who, but who we want to attract to Salt Lake City. With other large agencies providing take-home vehicles with no cost to employees, that was seen as a, as a pretty huge benefit to their officers and as an out-of-pocket expense for our officers. And then there, the third policy consideration that they brought up that we felt was important was that certain officers who live outside of that 35-mile limit were the same officers who really needed to have access to a car. So the chief can talk in more detail, and you might have talked about this last time. Um, a special victims unit detective, a SWAT uh, commander, and others you know, who are called out at all hours and who, who need to have a car with their gear in it accessible. So over the last year, we worked with police, the police department, fleet, finance, and the city's, city attorney's office to make what we think are some really practical changes in this proposed ordinance. So the proposed ordinance does a few things. One, it expands the distance from 35 to 60 miles, and that captures all of the officers we currently have working in the police department, unless we hired somebody that I don't know about yet. Um, two, it tightens up the reasonable use definition so that the definition for personal use, personal reasonable use um, that's with, is within the general scope of the employee's commute instead of essentially giving employees who take home cars, this is not just police department either, but employees who take home cars, basically carte blanche to drive anywhere in Salt Lake County and in their home county. So we had an issue beforehand where if you lived outside of Salt Lake, if you lived within 35 miles from Salt Lake City in a different county, you could not only drive all around Salt Lake County, 
but also in your home county, so Tooele, for example. But yeah, we have officers who live 37 miles away who didn't get to take a car home because of that 35 mile limit. So we, we felt like that was, you know, needed to be looked at in our current framework. So um, it also requires employees to self-report their standard commute and affirm in writing that they will not abuse the department policy and provides departments geofencing and auditing tools to, be, to review personal use. And then four, it limits the city's coverage of the vehicle to the state minimum insurance coverage and requires employees to carry supplemental personal liability insurance for personal or off-duty use, which the ordinance does not currently do. The city currently provides all of that supplemental. So the chief will dive into these a little bit in a little bit more detail, but overall we see this as a really practical update to the ordinance. It's responsive to those policy considerations that I just named, and also we feel better protects city assets and limits liability for personal use of, of this large asset that we invest in. Chief. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, Council. It, it's actually really nice to be here in person with you. I haven't done this for about a year or so. <laughs> So thank you for having us. But yeah, Rachel, that was a great overview of what we're looking at. Um, the next slide, please. Really just talks about the, the current policy where an officer can take their vehicle home if they live within 35 miles of the nearest city border. It used to be we put a pin in the middle of the city and said 35 miles from there. But they said, well, you could be back in the city and live at a significant distance from that so that's why we've moved it to the border. But the new proposal would take it to 60 miles from, in, from the closest border to which you live. Next slide. There are many benefits to our officers having their cars and taking them home. One uh, is that there are clean, these are cleaner, more efficient vehicles, fuel efficient, and some are hybrids. We're moving to a, a lot of them towards hybrids. This is in line with the city's mission of reducing, uh, the city's vision of reducing emissions. The number two benefit um, there's, there's different models of take home. In fact, there's some that uh, don't even have take home car vehicles. They run a fleet model. If we had a fleet model, uh, we would have to have officers come in, turn their, pick up a car. Uh, it would take anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes to do that. And then at the end of the shift, they would have to actually turn their car into a fleet, have it clean, fueled, maintenance. So there would be a lot of expenses and time that would be expended on both the start of the shift and the end of the shift. Also, we, we do direct reporting. Just last week when we were doing the marathon, we had so many officers out on those different posts that uh, when it came time for afternoon, those officers just took their cars and went right to work. If we had uh, that fleet model, you'd have to go take your car in or go find a car, switch out and move forward with you know your, your duty for that shift. The next one is improved staffing and, uh, and, and response times. If we it, no, the next one is, the third one is improved, wait a minute, I got messed up here, improved. The, the second one I, I mentioned, improve recruitment and retention. Look, our officers are having to move, live further and further away. I'm sorry, I messed up those numbers. And, and to do that, they're, they're, they're having to drive much further to come to work. If they could take their cars home, it would really be a benefit for our officers to be able to have that car, to drive it in. Um, to, to be comparable to other agencies, um, they are allowing their officers to drive much further as well. So we're now trying to keep those officers and, and, and recruit further. So it's, it's good for the current officers to expand that, that distance, but also it'll help in our recruitment and retention. The fourth is uh, imp uh, improved uh, accountability and maintenance. Um, and if it's, if, if it's everybody's job to take care of a car, sometimes nobody does it, uh, but officers are assigned a car, they'll take care of the car, um, they're responsible for bringing it in for the, the scheduled maintenance. If they, if they fail to do that, fleet will notify them. Also, those cars are assigned to a specific, a specific officer. If they have a complaint, a driving complaint, or there's an accident and damage, we know where to start that investigation. Operational readiness is number six. Or, or five. Um, Hang on one second. If we have a situation, much like we've seen over the last couple of years, an active shooter, a crisis, 
uh, a response. Our officers have their cars and their gear with them. They'll, they're, they're able to drive in and respond directly to wherever they, they need to go. They don't have to go to the public safety building or the Pioneer Precinct to pick up their car to, to respond. So it's a much better model for operational readiness. And then the last benefit is a lot of, a lot of times are, there's a peace of mind when officers are driving through communities to see that car, the optics of having a car in a community means a lot to the communities we serve. And also as they're driving to and from work, officers will stop DUI drivers, they'll respond to crashes, they'll block traffic, they'll respond to other emergencies. It's definitely a benefit for the communities that we serve. Next slide. That is the current map, just for your reference council, of the 35 mile radius from the, the current city borders. So inside that blue line is where our officers can currently live. Any questions on that? Rachel touched on the uh, the uh, the liability insurance uh, and, and and the benefit to the city for that. Next slide. And then, as we talked about, we there are some definite real time benefits, and I want to point those out through a couple quick examples. Um, the 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 uh, person's crime detective. Uh, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, there are there are some there are some benefits for for our, the, those that serve the community. Our person's crime detective lives 2.5 2.5 miles outside of the current uh, 35 mile range. That person, because of their assignment, uh, is is on call specific weeks during the, the during the month and year, and they're sometimes called out two or three times per week. They have to drive their own car to work, uh, and to to be able to be ready and have a car to drive to work that can significantly uh, extend their response time to, to, to any type of crime that they're investigating. Uh, we have a patrol sergeant who lives one mile outside the 35 mile radius. That officer is a member of our, as a sergeant with our public order unit. Um, they have to drive their car if they're called out to a riot or a civil unrest. They have to drive their car to either the Pioneer Precinct or the Public Safety Building to pick up their equipment and respond. Again, that is another 30 to 60 minute response time added to their drive in. And then we have a canine sergeant that lives three miles uh, outside the 35 mile radius. Um, again, that is a 30 minute delay, but the canine sergeant is a little different. They have to drive their own personal car, which is not equipped to transport a canine. Vehicle, uh, a canine. And those, those cars that we have, there's a cli climate control feature to them. So if, if it gets too hot or cold, it can, it can provide the necessary uh, comfort for the animal. And if the system fails, it honks the horn, it, it, it alerts the driver that the animal is in the vehicle and it's not being supported by the climate control it needs. So big benefit for, for the dog and for those we serve. Next slide. That is a list of the um, eight agencies that have uh, various take-home car policies, four of which we that have no car fees at all. So that's kind of what we're up against, Council. We're trying to compete against people that aren't other different agencies that don't have a fee uh, that they're charging their officers. Now, it's, I mean, this is, these are different uh, type of plans and different type of uh, programs, but uh, in recruitment and, and retention, it's a big issue having that car. In operational readiness, it's a big issue to have that car, and it definitely helps us as police officers respond and better, better serve our communities. Next slide. And I think those are yours, Jorge. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pass those to you. My numbers. Yeah. Um, well, uh, council members, last time this item was in your agenda. Uh, uh, sorry. Is it better? Yes, okay. Um, last time this item was in your agenda, uh, there were some questions about uh, trying to compare what would be the benefit, if, if there is a benefit of driving a personal vehicle versus a, a city, city vehicle. Um, for those that commute, um, well, let me, let me focus on this first uh, chart. We are, we are showing in this chart the cost to the city of owning and driving a vehicle. In the first column, you can see if this vehicle is taking um, 15 miles outside of, of the city border, what would be a 30 mile round trip. 
uh, every day that an officer is, an officer is, is working. Normally they work um, four day week, so eight days in a pay period. The, the first column, the biweekly cost, includes depreciation, uh, fuel and maintenance. This is, this is what it costs the city, right? The employee will be required to pay that amount, in this case, $45. Uh, the city ends up uh, subsidizing uh, $127.80 for that case, that scenario in which uh, an officer is taking their vehicle and they live 15 miles from the city border. Um, the total annual subsidy is about $3,300. Um, $3, hey, can I interrupt you just for yep, one second? Absolutely. We are not proposing in this ordinance to adjust the fee, the fee at yes. all, just to, just to clarify that. Right. So the fee would, will remain, mm -hmm. um, but what we're it's, it's also, I think it's hard to show exactly what the additional cost might be because we haven't done this analysis, mm -hmm. at least not to my knowledge, based on how many officers live at what distance away. So this gives you a, a range of what it costs to get this home, but we don't, we don't have exact figures on you know, what this could cost. We also don't know what the impacts will be on tightening down that reasonable use That's provision. Right. And so you know, without the, the ability to drive anywhere, we also think that that could result in the cost savings, which we're, we'll hope, hopefully be able to get more um, detailed data on over this year if you enact this. Right. And so just, just as an example, if you, if you focus on that first uh, uh, number, $172.90, that's the cost to the city to own and, and drive uh, the vehicle, right? If you go to the next slide, we ran a, a scenario in which uh, a person will drive a comparable vehicle that we currently have in the fleet available to take home. The cost every two weeks will be about $113 for that person to drive, and that includes fuel and maintenance. It does not include the depreciation of that vehicle because accounting for that will be a little bit more complicated. but. Um, and then if, uh, on top of that, annually, you, you are looking at $1,800 of um, other costs, including insurance, uh, registration, and, and um, uh, maintenance. But this is just a, a, a comparison. I know it's not apples to apples, right? Uh, we, we have specialized vehicles. Those are not available in the market, as, as Chief Brown mentioned. There are certain vehicles that have specific features for their functions, and we don't have them. But this is an average of, of what um, uh, we have in the fleet. And so assuming that someone um, is driving a vehicle, uh, th their personal vehicle to, to work, and the same scenario um, for, for the week is, is, is the same. So I don't know if you have any questions on this that I can clarify. Questions, go ahead. I, mean, my I, point. I, I do have a question, and it's more related to the fee. And I know that the, yeah. the city is not proposing a change in the fee, but I am. Um, I would like to share my thoughts into this. Uh, uh, that I believe that this could be a tool for our police agency to retain and recruit more officers uh, if we didn't charge one. Um, so, and I, but 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 to understand this decision better, I need to know how much money we're talking, right? And I, it seems like, you know, how many officers are using it? How many officers will be using it when it's, a, you know, if we expand this this limit? And I don't know. I mean, I, it will be interesting to know the actual number of how much we're talking money we're talking. We receive a, an email from um, from someone <laughs> uh, about this, uh, a police officer in in in, the, in a city. Uh, and we're talking about thousands of dollars that they pay to use this, and it, it, that's how I feel. And I know that this is not the conversation in front of us, but I wanted to share my thoughts. And I think, it, it, you know, it is a good tool. Other cities are doing it, um, and it's, I believe it's the right thing to do. But just leave it at there. Thank you. Council Chair, may I? Go ahead, Rachel. Um, thank you, Council Member Hui. Um, we did talk about this. Um, it's, it's a bigger conversation, of course, to offer to subsidize that entire fee. I think if the question is, or if the council wants data on what currently the fleet is spending on mm -hmm. um, police department, you know, fuel and maintenance in the police department, we have those figures. Um, 
again, or that's a conversation that we can have later, but the priority at, at the time was to be able to extend that range. So that's what we elected to do because we felt like we could at least enact that piece um, quicker and then if there's interest, we can talk about the fee in general. But I will say, Council Member Pui, if, if we did extend it to 60, I know that every officer within that 60 miles would take that car. Council Member Mauno. Um, so it sounds, I know the last time we talked about this, there's a little confusion about what the fee was based on. Sounds like the fee is based on how far your house is to the city border. And then that's just calculated and that's charged every paycheck to the officer. Right. Um, and am I understanding correctly that they're the, we've, we're also clarifying the policy so they can't just like drive their kids to the movies on a Friday night when they're not working if they're outside of our county or drive you know, somewhere kind of far. So they could just do things that are basically on their route to and from the city, from their, their assigned place in the city, is that? We were gonna to try to define it as reasonable use within a circumference around probably where they live. But right now, and like Rachel talked, if you lived in Tooele, you can drive to Wendover. <laughs> but if you live at 36 miles, you can't take your car home. So and I, it, it I really makes the policy much more applicable to what we're trying to do. That makes sense. Do. Yeah, and it, it makes sense not to have our police cars going to Wendover <laughs> all the time and us paying for the fuel for that. But is there um, a way, I'm just thinking environmentally, it's, it's better for people not to have to have two cars, right? Like it's, it's better to just not have a second car, but you know, the officer might want to go to Wendover. So is there a way that that calculation could, and our GPS could actually track when they're using their car and they could actually just pay additional fees to do that rather than having to purchase their own car and maintain it and have fuel? We just say, you know, we're going to figure out how much it, it's worth. And I don't know if that's way too complicated or <laughs> not the right policy, but I'm just thinking they're still going to have to have a second car and it would be better for the earth if they only had the one car. <laughs> like we don't want that much raw materials being used. And so I, anyway, maybe that's irrelevant. Maybe that's not possible, but. Council member, it is, it is possible to, to set up a geofence on each individual vehicle, but uh, monitoring that will require, uh, because you, you will get a report with a lot of data, how many times that person left that uh, circumference around their home, for example, right? And then calculating that so to see how much, if that was a policy, right? So it is possible, but it will require additional eyes and, and, and hands to, to process that data. All right, thanks. Can I just ask a clarifying? Does this mean that officers who live in the city then don't have to pay this fee at all? Right. I mean, I feel they, like they, that's an incentive to build some workforce housing, too. Mm. They, they haven't in the past, right? What's that? The, the officers in the city have not had to pay the fee currently. Right. Yeah, they yeah. don't pay so, it. As an incentive, as you said, yeah. Yes. <laughs> or a courtesy reward. Councilman Fella. Thank you. I just have, um, I, I'm fine with the proposed ordinance. I think it's great. Like, let's do it. That's just my thought right now. And but we can talk about fees later if we need to, but you know, um, I think it is a good incentive. Um, I do have a question for Hay just regarding fleet and where we are on new vehicles. Do we need to have new vehicles? Do we have enough vehicles? Um, is that gonna be something that the mayor talks about later sometime after a budget <laughs> session? I, I just, um, was thinking about it and I know a few years ago we funded for some new police vehicles but then sort of that went a little haywire and there was a recall I believe on some of the vehicles or something so maybe you don't have all of that information right now today but we could get in when it's your department's uh, budget maybe an update on what the fleet looks like or for police maybe just an update on what our fleet looks like and where we're at. Absolutely, we can we can include that, uh, council member, in, a, in our presentation. But uh, what I can what I can speak about is is the effort that our fleet director is is doing um, with the help of the police department to right size the fe the fleet. So looking at you know how many vehicles are there that uh, could be repurposed for for traditionally they have been assigned for certain functions. Maybe we can expand that so they are not 
uh, sitting idle in, in, in their parking lots or, or in the garage, right? So trying to right size the fleet uh, is, is, is the first step for it. And then identifying how many are realistically needed. So absolutely. If I could just add on to that, and maybe we could convince the legislature to expand impact fees so we can buy police cars with impact fees. That would be, be great. great. So yes. if anyone has a connection up there. <laughs> Thank you. So, can you? Uh, oh, sorry. Any other questions? I just had one question about the reasonable use. Could you kind of give me a little bit more, uh, warm and fuzzy on what that what that means? More information on the reasonable yeah, use. Yeah, reasonable discussion. use. So the way we've approached it here is that um, prior to receiving authorization to take home a car, the employee must establish their daily commute by calculating the shortest possible driving distance between their location of employment, whether it's the PSB or whether it's, you know, streets or whatever, um, to the employee's residence. And then each employee will be required to provide documentation of that commute. And they will also have to affirm in writing that they will not use the car personally outside of their department's policy. So this is gonna be sort of a multi-step process where fleet will have, I think, an overarching policy on what the take-home policy is, but each department will set their personal use policy individually, reasonable personal use. So it could look different from department to department. And so, you know, as the chief said, I think the goal is to have, you know, people not use their vehicles for just, you know, any long errand, randomly, um, but to allow some ability there for an officer to, you know, potentially run an errand um, before or after work or drive to a soccer game after work or be on standby time. This happens actually a lot. This is probably a better example of, you know, a kid has a soccer tournament in Park City and they're, which is probably pretty far away from their standard commute, but they're on call or they need to go to work right after or something like that. So there could be some flexibility there depending on specific circumstances in each department. But each department is gonna be really different in what's required. And so, you know, fleet is gonna be there to help, but departments are gonna need to shape that policy and then figure out how to keep track of that personal use on their own so that all that burden doesn't fall on fleet. Okay, so it's 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 really the, it's the, uh uh, department's responsibility to def to clearly define uh, reasonable use and fleet to kind of monitor that definition of, of reasonable use and kind of help them define it. Yeah, if, if I can uh, speak to it, Mr. Chair. Uh, fleet will provide the, uh, the citywide uh, comprehensive uh, policy, right? Providing guide guidelines and definitions. And then it is up to each department to, to um, adopt their own policy around um, reasonable use because it, it wouldn't look the same for, for the police department and the fire department. And, and many, perhaps another department doesn't necessarily allow for, for that because there is no reason to take a, a small sedan uh, to the grocery store. They are not going to be called back. They are not on standby, for example, right? But uh, officers would be. And so that's why we allow for, for that flexibility we will, we will uh, ensure that we have the definitions and then the limits are, are placed by each individual department. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Council Member I was wondering if there's a, it seems like a lot of work to keep track of who uses the car and where they go and trying, you know, it, it, to me it seems like there's a lot of like human resources in each department to figure that out where th that use could be, I mean, those hours could be used somewhere else to do something more productive than checking where they're going. So is there any, or have you guys thought of maybe a different way to give like, a, um, like an average of what an officer would do, mileage average, and then add a few more miles to it to say, okay, this is your, this is what you usually do, and then this is as much you know that you can go, and after that, maybe we need to re review what you're doing because obviously it's going too much, or, Alternatively, don't, aren't there trackers, like GPS trackers that you should put in each car and then somebody looks at it and see, you know, how far they're going, but then instead of like trying to figure out 
sign here and let us know that you went to the supermarket on your way to, you know, home. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, to me, it seems like complicated. It could, for... it could be complicated, and okay. we've tried to make it not that complicated in the proposed ordinance where it, the proposed ordinance says that each that fleet will provide access to this information. Um, I don't think we're envisioning a scenario where like every week we're truing up every employee's use compared to what they said their use was gonna be. But there will be you know, a certain amount of monitoring that's expected where if it's something that's wildly outside, or you know, let's say we get a call that there's a city owned car in Wendover, then we're gonna be like, okay, we should probably pull up and audit that employee's car and see sure see what it looks like. So I think there's a way to monitor for inconsistencies without it being like, a, you know, let's true up this personal use compared to what the employee said every hour. And that you're right, sense. Councilman Valdemaros, you're right. I mean, over time, it'll tell, you know, it'll, it'll kind of flatten out as to what people are using the car for. But things change. I mean, somebody may come to court two or three times in a, in a two-week period, which would, would spike their mileage, but they've, you know, they've got to come to court. So okay. there are different things that they'll have to attend, trainings. Whatever we can do to make your job easier, you know what I'm saying, and, and each department easier than what to me it seems a little complicated. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Ch Rachel, Chief, Jorge, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to item number ten, which is an advice and consent of the Public Service Department Director. Going anywhere, <laughs> Jorge. Yes. Tomorrow's not, and you're not going to leave anywhere. <laughs> uh, and good evening. Thank you for your patience tonight. And uh, Council Jorge, actually, just introduce yourself and tell us a uh, a little bit about yourself, and then we, we may have some questions. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, it, is, it is truly an honor, and I'm gonna take, take a deep breath. <laughs> All right, let's start with, with my name. My name is Jorge Chamorro. I am uh, originally from, from Mexico City. Um, I came to the U.S. about, um, let me think, about eight years ago. Um, I have lived in three capital cities, uh, country capitals and this and, and, and another capital city here in Salt Lake City. But um, originally from Mexico City, then I moved to Lima. I worked there for a little while, uh, moved up to Washington, D.C., and then uh, ended up in Salt Lake City, and I love it. <laughs> this, is, um, um, this, is, this is an awesome city, and I, I, I enjoy being here. So yeah, I've been working with Salt Lake City for about um, seven years since uh, 2015. I started with the Youth and Family Division, and uh, I made my way up within the Public Services Department. So it has been an awesome ride. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for your time yesterday. Uh, I loved the, the conversation Absolutely. Councilmember Wharton and I had uh, with you, and, and that was wonderful. Uh, I, I will open up the floor to other council members to ask uh, Jorge a question uh, before I ask him my question. Anybody have a question for Jorge for his, his uh, taking on this new large responsibility of public utilities? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Jorge will do great. Thank you so much for being in Salt Lake City. It's awesome that you're from Mexico City. I didn't <laughs> know that. And... Um, I, I was also an employee earlier for Salt Lake City, so it's always exciting to see somebody that is not from here work for Salt Lake City and with your background, and I think you're gonna do great. So Thank you. congratulations. Thank you. I'll, I'll just echo those congratulations and say also that I think it's great that we were able to uh, retain and hire from within and that you have kind of worked your way up the ranks of public services. And um, so, so happy to see you being elevated to this position, which is a big one, actually pretty enormous department that you'll be yeah. running. So thank you. congratulations. Thank you. That's my boy. I immigrants rule. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just one more thing. Ale, we have an issue. We are in the, the World Cup. Mexico and Argentina are in the same group. <laughs> So maybe in November things will change between <laughs> us. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> we know how that goes every time. So. Oh yeah, unfortunately, that hurts. <laughs> yeah. All right, absolutely. 
Cool. Good I'll just say I'm excited for you, Jorge. Congrats. Oh. This is great. And Thank you. And look forward to continue working with you. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, Jorge, I appreciated our conversation, and I also just want to congratulate you, and um, good luck to you, and um, I'm excited to see what you're going to do for public services. Thank you. Thank you. And hi to your mom who's watching. <laughs> That's right. She is. Exactly. She is. Well, if, if I can tell you a, a little story. Uh, I thought for sure that she was leaving today and she will miss this meeting. Um, we showed up to the airport and turns out that she wasn't leaving today. She's leaving tomorrow. So, <laughs> but she's watching. She's, she's here in the city and she's watching. So thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and I also appreciate it. again appreciated our conversation yesterday. That was wonderful to be able to get to know you, kind of understand uh, your thinking, uh, your priorities, uh, and I really appreciate uh, uh, your calm and your patience and your and your vision that you have uh, moving forward. And I think it's uh, it's going to be wonderful in public uh, utilities. So uh, thank you very much, or public service. Excuse me. Uh, Anytime. You're going to be on our agenda tonight. Uh, you need not be present to win, but uh, you can just go hang out with your mom, which is probably a, a, a wonderful evening for her final evening. So right. thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right. Is that it? Oh. <laughs> okay, Council, we're moving on to item number 11, which is the board appointment of the Business Advisory Board, Book Carson, and I'm looking around. He might be on... Line. There, there he is. There she is. Good evening, and thank you for volunteering to be on the Business Advisory Board. Please tell us uh, why you want to be on the board. Uh, the reason is because uh, I want to uh, use my experience and my skills to help improve our business community. I am also interested in supporting our existing businesses and attracting new businesses to uh, Salt Lake City. In addition, I also would like to be able to help improve our workforce development and work with government entities and other stakeholders. I also would like to uh, be able to advocate for small business owners, female business owners, and minority business owners. Thank you very much. Council, any questions for Book? And am I saying, can you please pronounce your name for me? Book like a book. Just like the book. Start right. Start with a P, but pronounce like a book. But start with P. Okay. And originally, just so you know, I'm from Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, and oh. I came to the U.S. the first time to get my PhD at the University of Utah. Currently, I am still teaching for uh, the business schools at the University of Utah and Salt Lake County College as well, and that's why I'm so interested in this position so that I can use my skill and my ideas and my uh, experience and experience. Well, thank you very much. Wonderful. I, have, uh, I appreciate that you volunteered and I appreciate that you want to be on the Business Advisory Board. It's wonderful. Uh, you'll be on our consent agenda this evening and uh, you are more than welcome to join us this evening, but you need not be there. But uh, thank you very much and you have a good evening. All right. You do the same. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Council, we have now a board appointment. You have the Cultural Core Finance Committee, uh, Shailene Gee. And I she, oh, there she is. She's back. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for your patience. No problem. Thank you for everything you're doing, including tonight. Oh, I appreciate that. And uh, tell us a little about why you want to be on this board or this committee. A um, couple reasons. Professionally, I'm uh, a vice president for community development at Zions Bank, and so that organization has always been and will always be deeply committed to the arts in Salt Lake City. Personally, I think many of you know me from a lot of the community development work I do on a range of things from homelessness to housing, but my heart and soul is rooted in arts and humanities and culture. Uh, from the very beginning all the way through my education. It's also the work that I'm most proud of professionally. Um, it's the reason I came back to Utah from Chicago to make a difference in this space here. So I am honored to be considered for this particular assignment. Well, th well thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, so you like our winters better than the Chicago winters? No comment. <laughs> 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 Any 
Any questions for Shailene? Oh, I'm excited. Thank you, Shailene. I know you're, in, sorry, I didn't mean to. Go ahead. I know you're involved with the city very much and, and, and the county, so I'm excited that you're once again wanting to work with us and volunteer some more hours, so I appreciate Thank that. Thank you so much. Okay. If I can just say the work that I'm most proud of professionally has not yet been in Utah. It was in Chicago and it was a full-scale initiative to reform and transform the south side of Chicago through an arts and place initiative. And so I'm hoping that we can supersede that here and that I can be most proud um, of the work that we're doing on the cultural core. And that's a sincere statement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, volunteering. Thank you for uh, all your future work on the, on the committee. So appreciate that much. You're going to be on tonight's consent agenda. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us, uh, but you don't have to. I'll be watching from okay. afar. <laughs> from afar. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and it's great to see all of you in person and be in this building. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Have a good evening. Council, we're moving on to the next board appointment it is uh, for Parks, Natural Land, Urban Forestry, and Trails, the Peanut Advisory Board. And we have Francis uh, Noy, if I have that correct. Or no. Oh. Francis, I, can you tell us how you pronounce your last name? Oh, it's pronounced Go. Go. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, volunteering for the, to be on this board, the PNET board. Uh, and tell us a little bit about why you want to serve on this board. Yeah. So I am, I guess, a recent transplant to Salt Lake City. Um, I am a biologist by day. And so when I heard about this position, like to serve the local community and sort of get involved more and dip my toes into, you know, what's going on in Salt Lake City, I thought, you know, I do have some experience in ecology and a scientist background, and maybe I can make a difference in this community that I've settled in and hope to get to know a little better. It's like, what is going on around us pertaining to natural lands, you know, both in community for people and community in the sense of ecology, nature, and our wild, urban wildlife. Wow, wonderful. Thank you very much. Any questions for France, Francis? You're off the hook on some easy questions. So thank you very much for volunteering and thank you very much for the future work that you can do on the peanut board. Uh, I look forward to uh, more conversations. As I told the others, you'll be on our consent agenda for this evening. You're more than welcome to join us. Uh, but you need not be uh, present. All right, have Thank a wonderful evening. Thank you. I think, board, we have one more, council, we have one more board appointment for the Peanut Advisory Board, and it's uh, Wiesam Kudher. I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, that one is not moving forward at this time. Okay. That is correct, Cindy. Thank you. Okay. And that will uh, conclude our work. I think I covered everything on the work session. I'm looking to Cindy Lou to make sure I did all, everything. But I think that's, uh, that will conclude our work session. And we have uh, a few minutes. We should probably, we're going to do the um, closed session after, uh, the form, after the formal session. We, we don't have a lot of time for, for dinner. We would want to do a, a quick dinner break, and then we need to start our, our formal session after that. Yeah. It's 10 of. Yeah. So hold on one second. OK, we'll start at the uh, formal session at uh, 7.15. We'll give ourselves 7.15. Okay, we're gonna take a 25-minute take a uh, dinner break. Thank you.